Open up with Foley coming out and looking stern. Said he was there to wish everybody a happy holiday, talking about this and that. He was mad that the mafia had lied to him and uh, and mangled Joe's arm. This is where they added the, the deal where... Now, not only did no, that, Joe that, get mangled... That came up later. It was AJ who dropped that bombshell. Oh, sorry. Different bombshell. I'm not even reading my own report, so hopefully nobody's reading along with me here. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, which is a failure. <laughs> no idea. Anyway, the mafia came out, and they had a big uh, argument back and forth, and uh, this and that, and... Uh, Yes, continue. I'm, I'm reading this. It's, it's been edited by our new copy editor, who I, I better not name him right now. But uh, Did the copy editor insert a mistake? Yeah, he inserted, he capitalized savages. Like, uh, like I was talking about Randy. Oops. What you, a fool. When you treat people like savages, shit was going to happen. Apparently that's when you treat people like Macho Man, shit is going to happen. I... Amazing. So anyway, Whoops. when you treat people like Macho Man, everybody, there's going to be a gang rape. That's the lesson of today's show. So anyway, they said Joe was in the wrong place at the wrong time. They invited Foley to join the mafia, and he uh, he said that he could not sign matches for the remaining mafia members at the pay-per-view because he was afraid they would put a hit out on their opponents. So, for example, he could not sign Nash versus Consequences Creed because he'd be concerned that they'd all kill Creed before the pay-per-view. My question is, how have you no authority? <laughs> That's a great question. You own this company. You own this company and you're afraid to sign matches because people might beat up their opponents. You can do nothing about this, Mick. Seriously. So, anyway, they uh, he ended up saying he was going to sign matches for tonight. Nash and Steiner against Devon and Styles. And Angle versus Rhino with Jarrett watching Rhino's back. And apparently there was no concern of the Mafia jumping these men before these matches. Oh. Only the pay-per-view <laughs> matches. Only the pay-per-view matches. There were a million stupid things in this segment alone. You had uh, Mick Foley. He began to list the main event Mafia's victims. He said, Samoa Joe. And I said, yes. And he said, Brother Ray. And I said, right. And he said, Petey Williams. And I said, what? When? And upon deep thought, I vaguely recall about two months ago, a backstage segment where they killed Petey. Yes. They <laughs> expected everyone to remember this vividly. Of course. They were wrong. So he moved on. Uh, he, he made his claim that he could not book pay-per-view matches. And he, he booked Booker T and Scott Steiner versus Brother Devon and AJ Styles. Kurt Angle called this a pay-per-view match. False. Name me a human being on the planet Earth who would pay, pay, to see Booker T and Scott Steiner versus Devon and AJ. Name one. Crumbly. Name two. <laughs> so then he got to the, what I consider the stupidest part of this entire deal, when he announced for the Angle Rhino match, he was going to put Jeff Jarrett at ringside to watch over things. Don West screamed, Good call! And I thought, Why? <laughs> you have guaranteed there's going to be interference or whatever in that match. It's a 100% certainty now. Forget about whether or not you think that's entertaining. He's supposed to be an authority figure who just ranted about how he was tired of gang interference. Yeah. And now he has booked himself into a place where there can be nothing but interference. Dumb. We got Chris Saban. <coughs> oh, Jesus. You all right? I swallowed air down the wrong tube. Chris Saban versus Kiyoshi with Shane Sewell as the referee. He was actually assigned to a match not involving the Sheik. That was great news, yes. Although the Sheik did come out to watch. So this match went four minutes and 25 seconds. It was very good. We had uh, a win by Saban. And then afterwards, we had the Sheik coming down to fight Sewell. Sewell didn't want to, uh, Sewell didn't want to fight. And uh, finally, he was about to when Suicide slid down the little slide. And uh, and cleared the ring. So anyway, the point was, everybody, four minutes, 25 seconds. They uh, were mentioning here as the Sheik was shoving and punching Shane Sewell about how if Shane fought back, he'd be fired. Fought back. <laughs> he cannot defend himself from a physical attack now. No. Dumb. All right. Now, what we're going to do, I've got a pad and a, well, I, I guess I like how people say a pad and paper. I've got a pad of paper. And a pen. I got a pad of paper and a pen, and I'm going to make a mark, an eye-shaped mark, 
for every segment that does not involve wrestling matches on this show. Uh, yes, so we're going to keep a tally. If there's not a wrestling match in the segment, it is going to receive a mark here on this pad of paper. So, we have the beautiful people outside with Kip, a fake Sarah Palin, and the blonde. It has now been two weeks... And we discussed it and recorded it once. I have no we earthly still idea. Don't know. I watched it. I read the Observer report. I've thought about it. I wrote my own report, and I don't know what was happening here. Except I know that the beautiful people were shoved into the crowd, and the marks were going to touch them. That's right. One non-wrestling segment. He <laughs> used the word marks. The, the the best part was they were afraid of being in the crowd. They are being separated from the crowd by a guardrail. Except that the guardrail was too short. It was not actually between them and the crowd. Poor security. We had a Jarrett Angle video package, which is a non-wrestling segment. Then we had a Jarrett sit-down interview with TNA. I'll count this as all one segment. I will give TNA the benefit of the doubt here, since they were interconnected. So we had the video package and the sit-down interview, and TNA asked him a question. And I believe that the question had to do with what went wrong with, with Jarrett and Kurt Angle. But the question actually concluded with these exact words. Working behind the scenes to advance this company, to grow it to a greater uh, to grow it to greater heights, boy, it just hasn't worked out that way, has it? This is what today said. Right. It just hasn't worked out this way. The company has not grown to greater heights. No. So that was bad. How can you write this and not notice that line? <laughs> that line leapt out at me. Working behind the scenes to advance this company, to grow it to greater heights. But boy, boy, it just hasn't worked out that way, has it? So they went on for a while. They talked about this and that and Kurt Angle and whatnot. And by and large, it was just boring. And then towards the end, I got annoyed when Tanae asked how a Kurt Angle win would affect the balance of power. And I thought, well, why would it? One guy legally owns the company. He is given power over to his pal Mick Foley, but I'm sure he could take it back at any point if he wanted to. And the other guy is an employee. Therefore, the balance of power should not be altered. And uh, Jared responded, losing is not an option. And I thought, why not? <laughs> what will happen to TNA if you lose? Nothing. You're not even the owner. You're not, you're... You handed it over to Foley. Yes. So... Who gives a shit if you lose a wrestling match? <laughs> What this, does this have to do with anything? My point is, this is a failure of a segment, and I did not maybe want to see Kurt Angle versus Jeff Jarrett anymore. We then had Angle coming down to intimidate today, said he had no sympathy for Jarrett or his girls, said Jarrett was right that it would be a fight, a bloody fight, and then when uh, he said he was going to cripple him, blah, blah, blah. Oh, tonight he said he was going to come out with... Uh, with uh, Here, Here's his exact quote, and I want to remind you, the main event of the show was Kurt Angle versus Rhino. And he was talking about Jarrett, what he was going to do to him, and then he said, to keep Rhino out of the way, I am bringing Sting to keep him occupied. I'll read that again. To keep Rhino out of the way, I am bringing Sting to keep him occupied. So, to review, <laughs> Jarrett was there to guarantee interference. Angle has outright said he does not care about the, the main event of the show. Why would anyone watch it? Well, I don't know. There's also a great... I do know that that is also... A non-wrestling segment. That is a non-wrestling segment. And there was also a great point here, and only in TNA moment, when Angle was shouting at the announcers all angry, and he looked up at the camera, and as soon as he made eye contact with the camera, the camera cut away. Rough cut with Robert Roode. This, by the way, was at the 39-minute mark with one match. Total non-stop action, everybody. So anyway, James Storm said that uh, people love to hate them. They hated Robert Roode because he was a millionaire, and he could buy anybody, and they hated Storm because of his good looks and because he could drink so much beer. <laughs> awesome. Tremendous. He was also very diplomatic. They, they compared beer money to America's Most Wanted, and he was uh, very polite comparing uh, Robert Roode to Chris Harris, and he says, Robert Roode brings something to the table that Chris Harris didn't, and Chris Harris brought some things to the table that Robert Roode doesn't. And I thought, what? A giant gut? <laughs> Uh, a couple of extra inches of useless height. A failed run in WWE. A very failed run. By the way. By the way, also, that was the another non-wrestling segment. That is a non-wrestling segment. Did you happen to watch the TNA rough cut, or not rough cut, whatever they call their internet little YouTube no. deal? Are you kidding me? <laughs> I only did because someone pointed it out to me, but they were discussing what they wanted for Christmas, and Mick Foley said he wanted the best of Brayden Walker 3 DVD set. And JB said, I remember that. That time he came out with his hands on his hips. 
And Mick Foley said, and then he walked to the ring. And Barrera said, then he wrestled that guy. Awesome. <laughs> Burials of Chris Harris will never fail to make me laugh. <laughs> we had uh, the blonde interviewing Morgan and Abyss, who also hate each other. And, uh, yeah. I, it's just they're, some stuff. They're angry at beer money. All that matters is this was yeah. another non-wrestling it was, segment. It was a very, very plain promo. On total non-stop action. And followed by a promo with AJ Styles and Brother Devon. Here is the point where AJ dropped the line about Joe's wife being in labor. And I, uh, now the time has passed to look back on this. I, I can somewhat forgive them because at least Joe's wife actually was in labor. But it still felt at the time... Adding this, telling us this now, a week after Joe was laid out, uh, felt like the entire thing was was made up and tacked on after the fact, like someone had watched the show and then decided, you know what, this needs more of a an edge. Have Joe's wife be in labor, yeah. And then they tried to retroactively make that part of the angle, and it just didn't work. Then AJ, she about, actually did go into labor, everybody, and they still <laughs> thought about it too late. They still did not think about it until a week later. And then AJ tried to vow revenge on the on the uh, the main event mafia. He tried to be crazy and scary, and boy, he is not Heath Ledger. And uh, then Devon cut a promo, and then Devon was awesome. He talked about how as tough his brother had been, but brother Ray, may, he'll be back physically, but he may not be back mentally, and he seemed kind of sad. And then he turns his attention to the main event mafia, and he vowed revenge and destruction and havoc and chaos and rage and fury, and it was great. That was, by the way, another non wrestling segment. Here on Total, non-stop action. Then we had Jeremy Borash interviewing the Machine Guns. This was at the 45, the 49-minute mark, and this was also a non-wrestling segment. And it gets better. I'll actually tell you the tally right now. We are now at seven non-wrestling segments in a row. Eight, if you count the the video package that we had uh, talked about earlier. And as this seven in a row non-wrestling segment aired, they promised that in ten minutes we'd have a match. If you're worried that people are going to turn off your show at the 49-minute mark because of a lack of wrestling, and you're so worried that you alert them when the next wrestling match is going to be, why didn't you just put a wrestling match there? I don't know. All right. I don't know. Interviewed the guns. They were funny, as they always are. And they talked about how they may face each other in the finals and that sort of thing. And then Eric Young ran up and slapped them, and they had a pull-apart brawl. This was tremendous. This was amazing. Alex Shelley's going to wrestle Eric Young in the, the uh, X-Title Tournament, and he was really pointing out that he was not intimidated by Eric Young because for the past however many years he had uh, been afraid of his own pyro and believing in superheroes and hiding under a mask, all of which is true. And he was just pointing it out. And Eric Young stormed in and said, hey, you're not going to talk bad about me anymore. And Alex Shelley laughed at him, and Eric Young slapped him, and I thought, what a dick this Eric Young asshole is. <laughs> he is... He, he is so insecure about his own shortcomings that when they are merely pointed out, he responds with violence. Yeah. Bad. So they had a brawl, and I will actually be as kind here as to count the brawl as part of the previous segment, even though it technically was another segment. So they brawled all over the place, and Creed and Lethal made the save. Three on two, babyface advantage, as always, and then the heels bailed. This so is we- a very long brawl. You, you could almost count this as a match, and that there was at least a lot of action going on. There were they were in their Don't speakers. There was a ref in the ring, which confused me for a while. But yes, it was just a brawl. And then we went to the back for Borash, which is yet another non-wrestling segment on Total Nonstop Action, which was followed by another non-wrestling segment on Total Nonstop Action. That being the girls in Santa outfits and Tracy signed the second annual Knockouts Street Fight Brawl. Don't know who would want to see it, but they signed it. I do want to go back to the Borash segment. He was plugging their TNA mobile service, which is all full of backstage gossip and real-world news. And what was the tidbit, what was the the drop, the, the tease that he was giving to viewers to uh, hope to make them customers of the mobile service? Why, he said, there are some contracts coming up in TNA, and there are some big names that may be leaving. Yeah. He was promoting that there are stars who don't want to be in TNA and are going to leave as soon as the opportunity arises. Or could. Bum! <laughs> well, uh, when you called, you found out that uh, Homicide and Hernandez are staying, so I don't know. So if you didn't call, you just assumed two people were leaving. I guess. And most people, I assure you, did not call. So anyway, everybody, total nonstop action. Four minutes and 25 seconds of wrestling in the entire first hour. And by our tally here, nine... Nine... Non-wrestling match segments in a row. Ten 
if you count the Kurt Angle video package prior to the Kurt Angle or the Jeff Jarrett sit-down interview. So there you go, everybody. Total nonstop action. Crumbly, please explain why this is acceptable. Anyone. Vince Russo, Jeff Jarrett. Well, they can't. AJ and Devon finally had a wrestling match against Steiner and Booker. And they had a uh, a good match and that Devon was angry that his brother had been killed. And so he tried to kill the heels, which is how it should be done. They did not exchange holds or anything like that. So anyway, they uh, they ended up brawling all over the place. And uh, <laughs> they wrestled for like three minutes. And it became a giant brawl with one heel and baby face over here, the other one over here, and they had it on a split screen. Even Tanae was confused. He was calling spots on one screen when, in fact, that, the guy he was talking about was in the other one. They brawled here. They brawled there. They were on the floor for a long time. I didn't know if there were no countouts. I didn't know if it was a false count anywhere match. Well, let me explain. They did, in fact, brawl outside the ring. They brawled all over the building. They went over by the stands, they went over by the wall, and one guy got handcuffed to a wall. All of this was was fine, apparently. The match just continued. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of it, the ref just threw it out as two guys were inside the ring. Doing moves. Apparently that's unacceptable in TNA to actually do wrestling. Two guys were in the ring, they just inexplicably threw it out, and even Steiner did not know and was trying to get a pinfall, and the ref was explaining that he already thrown the match out. So, anyway, Nash and Angle came down, went after AJ. Finally, he was overwhelmed. They tried to break his arm. Frontline made the save. They got beaten up as well. And who should make the save for everybody but Mick Foley? A fat, old, crippled, behind-the-scenes guy. Now, God bless Mick Foley. Mick Foley's a really nice guy. But he is round. He is spherical. He was huffing and puffing and gasping for breath. After this brief run-in, which involved him standing and everybody running into him. And he was the man who apparently was more powerful than all of the front line put together. Yeah. Better, scarier than Joe. More of a threat than AJ Styles. Tougher than Rhino. And and far above geek-like consequences Creed. Sure. So he then The announced... young front line, led by the guy who broke in and feuded with, like, Eric Embry. Gasping for breath, he signed Booker, Steiner, and Nash against himself, AJ, and Devon. So he is back in the ring at the January pay-per-view, and I guess he's got about three weeks to get in shape over the holidays. So <laughs> Good luck with that. Good luck, Mick. <laughs> Vince gained 40 pounds. I did, yes. And, and yeah, yes. Uh, there, there was also, I mean, we, we discussed how stupid this was, but there was a point during the brawl outside where this was... <laughs> I had to watch this in slow mo to count what happened here. The ca- there were two men fighting, and there was a camera showing them. I think it was right when Nash interfered, in fact. And as the action was going on, this all happened within less than two seconds. The camera zoomed in, then it zoomed way back out, then it zoomed in again, then it zoomed in again, then out again, and then back in. <laughs> It was just, uh, they were, it was like they had a great big lever. They were just pulling back and forth as fast as they could, zooming in and out. And boy, it was bad TV. Oh, impact, everybody. I lost my page here. Foley, by the way, I, I think you mentioned this, but I, I should recap it. He booked the six man for Genesis. We did talk about that. But this was an hour after he said he couldn't book the main event mafia and matches because he was afraid they would take men out. Well, he can't now because he's there. <laughs> now no one will fuck with him. Yeah. I see. Sojourner Bolt, Awesome Kong, and Raisha against Raka, Hemi... Wait, hold on. Hold on a second. Sojourner, Awesome Kong, Raisha, and Raka against Christy, Roxy, Taylor, and ODB in the hardcore, wacky Christmas chicks encounter. And uh, there really are no rules, Don explained. Did a lot of stuff. <laughs> Taylor did a big They dive. were laughing at the no rules thing, by the way. It was almost like... Uh, I remember the time on Nitro when there were the, the the Lucha guys were having the hardest core hardcore match ever, and the announcers were laughing at it. The announcers were laughing at this match here, although it was laughable, so it was different in that way. But they did not take this seriously. They were made it clear that it didn't matter what happened, and there was no point to watch. Rock Khan got pinned for the second week in a row with a cradle. Sucks to be her. What <laughs> the was, hell can you do? The main of the the pay per view match is going to be a rematch between Christy Hemi and Awesome Kong, and they set it up by having. Taylor pin Rocka. Yeah. Why? I don't know. And by the way, this happens on all the shows. <laughs> the champion has never pinned to set up title match. No, just nor does the challenger random. beat anybody. No. <laughs> it's so it's random, random people. This is a random thing. 
And uh, we, we recorded our show on Saturday, and then you axed it. And that actually made me angry. I never told you that. But I'm actually now very happy we came back here to have my notes, because there was an important point here. Mike I know Tanae what I'm doing. What's that? I know what I'm doing. Now, you're right here, you certainly did. Mike Tanae and Don West, in the middle of this uh, this knockout stag match, whatever the hell it was, they were a sort of plug that uh, if you go to Universal Studios, Studios, everyone, you can get in the Impact tapings for free. What that says to me is that their live crowds for Impact tapings are dropping. People are starting to realize, this shit sucks, and I'm not going to go anymore. Maybe uh, their tickets are free anyway, so it may not affect their business at all, but I take it as a positive sign that the end of TNA is near. Well, unfortunately, that's not going to happen in 2009. My New Year's resolution is to see TNA dead. (laughs) Wow. Wow. Well, unfortunately, Vince, I hate to tell you this, but your other New Year's resolution better to be to stop being so lazy. Because you alone will not be able to cause this. I I tend to pull it off through the power of sheer hate. (laughs) Good luck. Just by sitting in my room and stewing, I expect people to to stop watching. Then we had Kurt Angle with Sting against Rhino with Jarrett. They introduced Jarrett before Rhino, and Angle was distracted by Jarrett. Rhino went to work on him. And then we had Angle spitting on Jarrett. He hit the ring. A million referees hit the ring. This was not a disqualification. Men were everywhere, swarming the ring. This was allowed to continue. So they go to commercial, they come back. Then they end up outside. And Jarrett is out there, and Angle slaps him. The heel angle slaps Jarrett, the baby face, right across the face. Jarrett gets so mad that he builds up a head of steam, and he starts rushing at Kurt. I'm not sure what he was going to do, but he rushes at him. Maybe a spear. A head full of steam. Angle proceeds to move, and Jarrett runs into a metal guardrail. What a goddamn idiot. <laughs> and he's the baby face. He's the baby face. This spot was like something out of, like, a Keystone Cops movie. (laughs) And it's the Keystone Cops that hit the guardrail. The fools are the ones that hit the guardrails. Jeff Jarrett ran at Kurt Angle. Kurt Angle moved. Jeff Jarrett's reflexes were so poor that he was unable to stop running, and he hit the guardrail. At least when you run the ropes, we can pretend that when you are propelled off the ropes, you cannot help but run quickly in the opposite direction. Or at least the guy is throwing you. He ran under his own power at a man. The man moved, and he continued to run until he was stopped by metal. Dumb! God, what a fool. So anyway, he looked like an idiot. Then he tore off his shirt and hit the ring. This time it was a DQ. Well, apparently you can interfere when you have your shirt on, but if you're nude from the waist up, DQ. <laughs> apparently that's the case. Or, or it's like... Two strikes. We'll let you. We'll let you blatantly interfere once, but come on now. You do it twice. Seriously, this is a sport here. So he hit the ring, and by the way, he hit the ring when Kurt Angle had the ankle lock on Rhino. So Rhino, the challenger for the championship match in the main event of the next pay per view, had to be saved here from tapping out. Yeah, of course. So then we had a million people in the ring, including BG James. And in the melee, Angle punched him, and the show immediately went off the air with Angle having punched B.G. James. <laughs> B.G. James being laid out. We were supposed to be appalled and horrified. A, so. a wrestler, a six foot four, two hundred and fifty plus pound wrestler, had an, been punched. An ex marine, a multiple champion, a tough guy, <laughs> had been punched, and now we are. He is the damsel in distress, and we are laying on the heroic Jeff Jarrett to revenge his honor. Yeah. Dumb. Amazing. Speaking of dumb, there's a point in here. I believe Angle had a sleeper hole. How many times did you chant dumb during the show? Was Every it time more or less times than they had New Year's resolution segments? That's my New Year's resolution. Every time they point, say something dumb, I'm going to point it out in the simplest, shortest term possible. All right. So, Kurt Angle had, I believe, a sleeper hold on Rhino here. It was a wrestling move he had on of some kind. And uh, Don West said, and this is a direct quote, and I assume he's talking about Rhino here when he says he, this isn't the way he sees it going down. He'd rather do it on the battlefield in war. He was losing a wrestling match to a wrestler with a wrestling hold. How is that not going down in war? Did he mean a literal war with of course. a tank or a gun? Of course. And if he saw it going down that way, why did he not join the army? I don't know. Bum! A very, very short note. This show aired on Christmas night. Yeah. Everyone in the world was either at a Christmas party or traveling home. You're wrong. Or Chris from a Christmas party. Did you see the impact rating? No. It did very well. No. <laughs> yes. Uh. These people are so loyal that they watch this show on Christmas night. 
Facts. Which, by the way, which, by the way, let me ask you this question. Why would you air the show on Christmas night, but not New Year's Day? I don't know. What but, in the hell is anybody doing on New Year's Day? All they're doing is sitting at home and watching TV because they're hammered. Right. I don't know. I don't either. To the back! Start talking about Impact. I liked Impact this week. I had discussed that already. I thought it was paced much better than usual and thus a thumbs up. Uh, open with... Boy, your standards have dropped. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I usually leave this so angry. Anyway, show open with Eric Young and Alex Shelley. Eric Young's entrance. For many, many years, of course, he was the guy who was afraid of his own pyro. And then three, four months ago, whenever it was, he had his awakening, and he's a tough guy now. And his pyro went off, and he didn't jump. He turned around and looked at it and turned back and smiled and went and went on. Once it made sense. Now he does it every time. His pyro goes off. He turns back and looks at it. Then he looks back and says, ha I was not scared. Now we're supposed to be impressed that he is not scared of his own pyro. No, it's not even that. It's it's this annoyed me too because, and boy, could I could I really nitpick this segment if I wanted to, especially the match where I guess Alex Shelley is a heel, but he was the one doing all the high flying at the beginning and getting the TNA chance. Yes. So I have no idea what's going on. But anyway, the point is, the the reason it annoys me is because the pyro goes off. He looks back at it. He looks at the audience and gives a smirk, and it's like TNA telling us that. We should care. I guess. They they're, they're, they they think that we were so invested in the Eric Young character that was afraid of Pyro that now we're into the fact that he's not afraid of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. When in reality, nobody gives a shit. No. Nobody gave a shit when he fell down them before, and nobody gives a shit now. It's not like they created this legendary twist to his character. Yes. That now we're like, boy, remember back in the day... Remember back in the day when Eric Young was afraid of the pyro, but now he's not? Nobody cares. No. No one cares. Very, very lame. So then they had this match, and you couldn't nitpick it. It was a perfect match, but you know what? It was pretty goddamn good for an impact match. They got some time, not a lot, but perhaps four, maybe five minutes. And uh, Eric Young, as much as he's this whatever his stupid character is now, and as much as he was wasted as a goofy comedy babyface for so many years... God, he's good. We just let him wrestle. Well, anybody who's been listening to this show for a while will know that we went to an indie show with Eric Young about four years ago. Yes, forever ago. And he was a fucking great wrestler. Yeah. And so for three years I asked, why isn't this guy being a great wrestler? Why is he being a dumbass comedy figure? We don't know. And now they figured it out. They finally figured it out. So yes, I... But all that time we were stupid. You could argue that every single wrestler in TNA is wasted because they have a great roster that puts out a shitty show. But there are a few wasted more than Eric Young. That being said, he did not win here. Uh, he, he lost uh, to Alex Shelley when uh, Saban tried to interfere. First, the machine guns clumped together, and uh, Eric got, got a near fall. But then he got kicked out, and uh, Eric, uh, Eric, Chris Saban hit a drop kick from the apron to the head, and Alex did the slice bread number two and got the win. So a very, very fun match that is set up uh, on the pay-per-view, the machine guns versus each other for the X Division title. Then we had Shane Sewell as a referee of that match, uh, confronted by the Iron Sheik, the new, uh, I guess he wouldn't even be the Iron Sheik, the uh, Tin Sheik. I saw, I was at, or I was ordering coffee at the, I was thinking it was when I was on vacation at the airport, and they had a, the TV monitor had like a trivia deal, and the trivia question was in the, I think it was in, in WWF's first televised match in 1984, who did Hulk Hogan defeat for the championship? And the correct answer was, and I'm not making this up, the genie chic. <laughs> this was a poorly, poorly researched trivia question. <laughs> ah! I like the aluminum chic. That's better. Anyway, he came out and he started shoving Sewell, who finally freaked out after uh, he was attacked, accosted by he, he this man. He was beaten savagely. He yeah. was attacked and mangled to the point where Don West said, you can't expect a man to take this. And I thought, no, you can't. Then Mike Snay said, this is ridiculous. And I thought, yes, it is. So anyway, the storyline was he was not even allowed to defend himself oh. from an attack, an unprovoked attack. So he finally went nuts and beat him up, and then Cornette came out and... and uh, and Cornette said, I quote, I told you that you had to be impartial. Now, Bashir wasn't even in the match. No. This was an 
after match incident. Right. What is there to be partial or impartial about? I don't he know. He was attacked. I can't tell you. By not defending himself, he was he was partial against himself. Yes. Anyway. So, yes, uh, so Cornette said he had to keep his word, and he told Sewell that if he wasn't partial, he would be fired, and so he was fired. And so Sheik had a party, and Sewell was sad and on the verge of tears, and Cornette told the Sheik to stop his laughing because there's more. He told Sewell that he would be fired for three days. In three days, of course, they have a pay-per-view, and he said in, in three days, you'll be rehired as a wrestler. Now, another logic, gaping, gaping logical in this story, besides the fact that it was ridiculous that he would be fired if he defended himself, as he explained in a promo... I know. About a month ago, he had to retire due to a neck injury. Yeah. Now he is going to be rehired as a wrestler. He's just magically better. Yeah. This is dumb. Well, but Kurt Angle broke his neck in return. He never cut a promo saying he had to retire. Well, sure, but anyway, the point is, per TNA standards, everybody, yeah. this was pretty damn good. Here is what I will get to. Yes, it, it led to the fact. But because of, despite the retarded way they got there, it led to them building a character, a baby face, who the fans wanted to see kicking man's ass, heels ass. It was held off for a long time. Now they've been told they're going to get to see it at the pay-per-view. The fans went crazy. I went crazy. And remember when I said I was more excited for Matt Hardy and Jack Swagger than anything else in WWE? I am far more excited for Shane Sewell versus The Seek than I am for Matt Hardy versus Jack Swagger. The Seek? I meant to say chic, but I have a speech impediment where I can't talk right. But this is going to rule. This is the best thing TNA has done in forever. Now, again, I, I must preface by saying that you must grade with a curve when you watch TNA. Because per TNA standards, this was awesome. However, I could not go as far as to say that this was awesome per regular wrestling standards because the whole gist of it made no sense. Every single twist in the storyline was fucking dumb. Yeah. But at least it paid off with the people being happy and Shane Sewell wrestling the Sheik. Yes, and they did end the way it should have ended. Yes, so I guess that's good. And uh, but the convoluted, dipshit, nonsensical way they got to it was kind of dumb. And they, when they were, when they ran down the pay per view card, they would put up the graphic for every match, and you'd see a video of each man, just a very short little four second clip. Usually, a guy would be flexing or pointing to himself or scowling, whatever. For Shane's, he is wearing his ref shirt. He looks at the camera, starts to shake, and then tears it off in furious anger. Everything this guy does is awesome. Then we had a main event mafia promo where they all cut a promo about the pay-per-view on Sunday, one at a time. Uh, this was, was high comedy. It was all right. It was the usual stuff. <laughs> if, if you if you just listen to what they said and weren't really paying attention, they all said, we're going to win on Sunday, so it was fine. If you actually listen to what especially Kurt Angle said, high, high comedy. He vowed that this Sunday there would be a total shift in power. And I thought to myself, how is that going to happen? They're going to win a bunch of wrestling matches. I don't know. So what? Then he said, he explained that the total shift in power would come when Foley and Jarrett will be taken out. Now, these are not loser leaves town matches. No. Not loser gets fired matches. So apparently he's threatening to kill or at least place both Mick Foley and Jeff Jarrett into a coma. Yeah. I see. So then... They showed Jeff Jarrett and Mick Foley and Jerry Borash watching backstage, and they were all staring sternly at the monitor, and Jarrett was so upset he put down his mug of coffee. Herm. So then Kevin Nash said, don't put off today what you can do tomorrow. This is not edited out. <laughs> and uh, then they just... They don't were... put off today <laughs> what you can do tomorrow. Right. And everyone looked at him, and he just kept talking. <laughs> and it was not edited out. Do not put off... Today, yes. this is like a fortune cookie that I cannot decipher. <laughs> it's a poorly translated fortune cookie, yes. Do not put off today what you can do tomorrow. What does that mean? I don't even know. I've been trying to figure this out for two hours now. <laughs> I have no idea. But uh, the, 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 everyone in the mafia got to put speak off for a today. bit. They cut backstage, and Boras started to ask uh, Foley and Jarrett how they're going to survive. The mafia vowed to take them out this tonight. There's a point of this, and before Jared could respond, Devon and AJ showed up, and they represented the front line, and basically they vowed to have their back. What amused me here was Devon had Brother Ray's red flannel, and he handed it to Foley and said, Ray would want you to have this. <laughs> and I laughed, because the only reason Ray wears flannel in the first place is because he is, and this is, a, I, I believe you would admit this, he has modeled his entire career about being a Cactus Jack ripoff. Tremendous. Don't put off today... 
what you can do tomorrow. Remember when he was the very, very first time he showed up on Nitro after the, the, the switch. When Diesel showed up on Nitro and he said, so this is where the big boys play. Look at the adverb. Play. Don't put off today what you can do tomorrow. He also had a Stephanie McMahon line where he said, why wait? Let's take out Foley and Jarrett tonight, which they proceeded to not do. <laughs> Hell of a plan. This is a dumb promo. We had a lot of Sarah Palin bullshit. I'll, I have one comment to make about this. Petting zoo. No more. I have a quick comment to make about this. <sighs> At one point, one of the beautiful people I turned to the other and asked, where is Kip? And her partner responded, he is done with this. Yeah. I'm not making that quote up. Kip is done with this. Oh, yeah. Awesome Kong beat a girl named Madison Rain, who they claim from Seattle, which is not true because there's no way I could have missed this woman. <laughs> she was the best-looking woman on the entire show. Yes. And so they beat her. So they just quashed her. Yeah. Way to go, TNA. And uh, her name was Madison Rain, as noted. And, and uh, the only other thing of note was Raisha Raka and Sojourner Bolt were out there as the Kong Taraj. Get it? Kong Taraj. And I don't know if it happened on the Best of show. I have no idea where Sojourner Bolt in this group came from. I do recall them doing an eight-girl eight, eight tag. There is no, there is no, no reason. No memory of this whatsoever. But regardless, there is no reason for Sojourner Bolt to be in their stable. Unless they just want to book a race war. Whereas now all the white girls versus the black girls and the white girl who pretends to be an Arab. No idea. This happened with, like, uh, Legacy. I suspect like a not. new person would just show up on Raw one week and they'd never explain what happened or no, why. Legacy would not walk out with, for example, D.A. Smith and no explanation. So we got interviews with Abix, Abyss and LAX. Abix. I have no idea what they said. All, actually, I do know. I know uh, some of what he said. I know that Homicide, and i got to bring this up, actually, because I'm going to talk about it in a little while here. Homicide was talking about how LAX was never breaking up. And I thought, since when was there ever news that they were going to break up? I, I presume they were acknowledging Internet rumors of their imminent demise. Which had never, ever been mentioned on the show. No. You wasted time on national television acknowledging internet rumors that you've never talked about on the show a single time. Right. Fuck you. Yeah. So, then we had, uh, and I'll actually jump to the point I was trying to make right now. Later on in the show, there was an interview with the Machine Guns and Mick Foley. It was the next segment, actually. Uh, was it? Yeah. It went with this promo, LX right. promo, Machine Guns promo. All right, so they're, they just did a promo. And the point of it is, that in the middle of it, Foley made a reference to Bill Kazmaier and Oz. Yeah. That was funny. Now, why was that funny? But I got enraged when LAX was talking about how they're not going to break up. Well, I will explain it to you. Mick Foley threw in an inside joke in the middle of his promo. If you knew what he was talking about, it was funny. If you did not know what he was talking about, it didn't matter. It was one throwaway line in the middle of a much longer promo. Whether you knew about Bill Kazmaier and Oz made absolutely no fucking difference in the grand scheme of this promo. LAX spending the majority of their promo talking about how they're not going to break up. They are acknowledging a rumor where if you knew about it, Great, which is the min the minority of the people watching. But if you didn't, you didn't understand a single word they were saying in their promo or why they were talking about it. That is a failure. Anyway, uh, the Abyss promo, he was strange and he uh, blamed uh, beer money for, and I quote, "getting me drunk and all." And then he said, "because of you two, Matt's mad at me." So basically, uh, he, he's he wants Matt to like him a lot, and this just came off really, really gay. Just fuck it. I'm going to jump forward here to uh, Beer Money. Um, this segment about how awesome they were and what great baby faces they were. Yeah, they, they, James Storm was talking about how he, more, more than anything else, he loves his daughter and his dog. Yeah. <laughs> He's, uh, and they're both talking about how hard they've worked to get where they are, and Bobby Roode just wants to be remembered as someone who entertained the fans. I was watching this thinking, what the hell is the point of this? 
You know what they're going to do is uh, eventually, maybe even at the pay-per-view, turn him babyface. But... After this show, I was convinced that's where they're going. Well, I mean, if, if they do, shouldn't you have done that and then aired all of these? Maybe it's just me. I... But they, they aired a month's worth of LA uh, of beer money promos, putting them over his baby faces, and then they lost the belts. <laughs> and how did the they build. Lo- and how did they lose those belts? It's amazing that, that, uh, that WWE spends four months, or uh, at least four weeks, building up the return of John Cena, to pop a buy rate at a pay-per-view. And TNA spends four weeks building up beer money to take the belts off them on free TV. That is an excellent point. <laughs> it's ridiculous. And let me let me get into this match right here. First off, we had Matt Morgan against Robert Roode. Now, as the match was starting, they were out there talking about the problems that Abyss and Morgan were having. Now, serious question. How many matches do they have in their entire careers together where they were not having problems? Maybe one? Two, perhaps? Sure. So you give them two matches where they're friends, and then you start the the dissension between them. Well, that's the classic Vince Russo TNA move. Every time a new team gets together, they must immediately start fighting. But it's just, how can you not figure out that no one cares? Because they're retarded. How can you possibly care about two people fighting when they never got along in the first place? I to answer your question, Brian, I don't know, but it's nothing new. So they had this match, and uh, I'm just going to read this sentence that I wrote right here, and then we'll dissect it almost word for word. Rude got the heat after Jackie cut off Matt Morgan as the referee was distracted on the ramp. Rude got the heat after Jackie cut off Matt Morgan. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. Jackie cut off Matt Morgan as the referee was distracted on the ramp. The ramp. The fuck is the ref doing out on the ramp? Well, apparently uh, James Storm and Abyss were brawling. The, the ref, ref decided... is all the fucking way up on the ramp. The ref decided to stop doing his job. So Jackie can cut off Matt Morgan. So 120-pound Jackie can get off the seven-footer. Yeah. So then, okay, fine. If you're going to accept that happens, fine. But then, like, about a minute later, James fucking Storm. James fucking Storm attacks Matt Morgan in front of the ref. This was not the best thing on the show. They had to distract the ref for Jackie's interference, but not James Storm. No. And, and, later on in the same segment, Jackie got involved again in front of the ref this time. <laughs> okay, now here's the funny part, everyone. Think of everything we've said about this match in this segment. It's, it's summer. It's going to plummet downhill right now. The dumbest thing I've ever seen, maybe. So Rude, one of the dastardly heels, gets sent over the top and blows out his knee. Match grinds to a halt. Trainer but comes literally out. Literally, in this case. Rang the bell so that Morgan won via ref stoppage. So... At this point, I'm, I'm like, okay, so now you're telling me that the heels are going to go into their tag title match of the pay-per-view with a major physical disadvantage against two giants. Right. Stupid. Oh, yeah. It gets worse. Oh, yeah. So, out come Jay Lethal and Consequences Creed, who decide now is the time to cash in money in the bank. Now... When CM Punk took advantage of Edge's disability to cash in money in the bank, he did kind of come across as a cowardly pussy in some ways. He was taking advantage of an injured man. You know what I mean? As, yes, you're correct. But he still came out, and he won in like 30 seconds. That That is an important part of the story, yes. That is an important key to this tale. So these two baby faces come out, to, in a cowardly manner, take advantage of an injured heel and in a two-on-one match win the tag team titles. That was their plan. That's goddamn stupid enough. Okay, so it's stupid thing number two now. Now what happens is the match ends up going about eight to ten minutes. They could not put the single man away. It was two-on-one. Right. Advantage baby faces. Yes. And it took them eight minutes. 
eight minutes to win the tag team titles. And James Storm got the heat. He did. Creed went up top. They were kicking his ass as the fans chanted, let's go, cowboy, because he was bravely, and he never protested, by the way. No. He stepped right up to the plate and said, I'll fight you two fuckers. And they were kicking his ass. The fans were chanting, let's go, cowboy. Creed went up top. Let's go, cowboy. Let's go, cowboy. Creed went up top. Robert Roode, a legal participant of the match, who was only out because of an unfair, cruel leg injury, fought through his injury to climb, to struggle up to the top rope and shove Creed off. Yes. Or crotch him. So, through this heroic act, Consequences Creed was cut off. James Storm continued to valiantly, valiantly fight one-on-one. One-on-two. Well, it was one-on-two, yes. Storm managed to, to to tag in. They did the beer money spot, and he tagged back out, because all he could do to do his injured leg. So, the match continued for a while. The longest match on the show, by the way. <laughs> the I longest? swear to God. It went to a commercial. Yeah. It went through a commercial. So the, 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 the I would also like to note that Don West during this match said the following lines, which I am not making up. First he says, they realize they have a two-on-one advantage right now. This is what he said of the baby faces. And then later he said, you know they were looking for a situation like this. What fucking pussies? <laughs> yes. That's what he now, said. There is more. There is more. So after... Consequences Creed finally made the hot tag to Jay Lethal, who jumped in, ran wild for a bit, and then got cut off and James Storm hit his finisher. Punked! Punked. Now, he hit the eye of the storm, Lethal kicked out, there was a kerfluffle, I think Jackie got involved. A and kerfluffle? There was a, 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 a much to do, much going on. Behind the ref's back, Jay Lethal picked up the briefcase. Yeah. He hit James Storm in the head. The ref turned around, and Lethal got the pin. The babyface <laughs> used a briefcase and hit the handicapped heel <laughs> in the head with it for the pin. Now, if you took this exact same segment and could somehow reverse polarity so all the heels were babyfaces and all the babyfaces were heels, this would have been the best segment ever. Yeah. But it was so completely ass-backwards. Yes. All of it. Yes. Every step of the way. The best was afterwards, after the match, the front line is in the back, and they are celebrating like they have accomplished this great feat. They're jumping up and down and celebrating with their titles like they have won them in something other than a completely underhanded fashion. And Devon goes, let's just let them stay here and enjoy their moment. Now, I cannot knock this, because if, if you just happen to turn in right then, you would think, wow, this is pretty cool. They at least... As stupid as the match was, they did their damnedest to make the title switch seem important and cool. They tried to make it seem like a big deal and a positive thing that Creed and Lethal were, ta- were the tag team champions. So, yes, the match was retarded. <laughs> retarded. Literally retarded. But they, they, they did their best to try to make it seem like a big deal. They did not go to the back for, I don't know, a Shark Boy promo. They made this seem important. So I, I cannot fault them for the segment afterwards. But the the Rude Morgan match, followed by the tag title switch, was the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Then we had BD James crying backstage. He was weeping and shedding tears. A six foot four, two 240-pound Marine crying because of things that Kurt Angle had said about Jeff Jarrett's wife. I don't know what to say. I, I, this is a, this, disgusting. There's a word. This is disgusting. Then they had a match, and again, if you look at this in another context, it was a fine match, but I have seen BG James in exactly one match in like the last six months, and here he was kicking out of Kurt Angle's finishers. Yeah, Kurt Angle. Okay, so they're having a match. It's fine. You know, Kurt Angle's awesome. BG James is good, so they're having a fine little impact match, and... uh <laughs> Uh, BG hits the pump handle slam, which, not that he's won a match of this move in eight years, but as far as I know, it's still his finisher. So he hits the pump handle slam, he makes the cover, Kirk kicks out, Kirk cuts him off, hits the angle slam, I'm thinking, win! This is fine! And then BG James kicked out! Yeah. They killed Kirk's finisher three days before the pay-per-view. And by a retired wrestler. By, a, by the guy who was an interviewer just a few months ago. Yeah. So, then Angle put him in the ankle lock, and he finally tapped. 
Then the mafia hit the ring, and and uh, they put the the chair around Miji's ankle. And you remember how this used to be dramatic? Yeah. Like they would put a chair on somebody's ankle, and everybody would start screaming because they would know something bad was going to happen. And right before the heels stomped on it, somebody would come out and make the save and save that person's career. Or, worst case scenario, the heel would actually give it one good stomp, and the guy would sell it yeah. like he'd been in a Humvee accident. As, well, yeah, there's a reason they call this... Pillmanizing the leg. Yeah. Steve Austin did it to Brian Pillman once, and then it was not done again for years and years and years. But as you note, every time it was prepped, people rose to their feet and began to shriek. Yeah. So here we have the main event mafia. They take uh, they, they take BG's ankle, which has just been ankle locked. They pillmanize it by putting it in the, the chair, kind of wrapped around it. And then they stomp on it repeatedly. About 42 times. Like you were trying to put out a fire. Yes. <laughs> Stomped and 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 stomped. And it became comical. So, and I'm thinking, all right, BG James has been laying in a pool of his own blood for a couple of minutes here. The mafia came out and they took their sweet time. Where the fuck is the front line? And it wasn't until after a commercial break when we had A.J. Rhino and Devon in there as well. Before the commercial, Foley and Jerry came out by themselves to clear the ring, but it took me a long-ass time to get there. And you noted this last week, but it didn't really hit me until this time watching him run. Jesus Christ, Mick Foley's fat. He's it's been in better shape. He is fatter than me. Yeah. By a great degree. And finally, after commercial, we had A.J. Rhino and Devon there. And uh, for those of you that remember the front line, there's a lot more people. <laughs> Apparently they're so happy about winning those tag titles in an underhanded manner that they're still back there celebrating while BG James is getting his ankle broken. Oh well, he ain't a frontline guy anyway, so who gives a fuck about him? So then we had Jarrett in a ring in a chair to uh, give his go home speech, and uh, it was roughly the equivalent of the speech that I gave to Americal a moment ago. He, he started by saying that he tried to set an example of by doing the right thing every time, and I thought to myself, okay. Even for the devoted hardcore fans of this company, you've been a heel far more than you've been a babyface. And you never did the right thing. You never did the right thing. And even when you were a babyface, most of the time you were the, you know, the the, the often ripoff who broke the rules and was still cool. So anyway, they finally brought Foley in there, and he cut a phenomenal. I will say he cut a phenomenal go home promo, and uh, talked about how he was. His beard was turning white, his tooth was all gray and fucked up, his face was haggard, he walked a little bit funny, but by God, he was still the hardcore legend, and he said he might not be as good as he once was, but on Sunday, he'd be as good as he ever was. This ruled, and I don't think it's going to beat the lockdown numbers. I would predict 40,000 buys. That will be my prediction, which is actually pretty goddamn high for a TNA pay-per-view. Well, it should do better, certainly, than what they did last month. Per, I will say it again. Per the standards of, like, your average WWE pay-per-view, this was just nonsensically retarded. But per TNA standards, they did a good job building up a pay-per-view. So that will get them, yeah. I would say, one-tenth of what SummerSlam's going to get. So no. 40,000 buys. I will say, they did a good job of building up Kurt Angle versus Jeff Jarrett. They did a good job of building up AJ, Devon, and Mick versus Booker, Steiner, and Nash. They did a horrible job of building up Rhino versus Sting. Well, it doesn't matter. I, I guess it doesn't, but... Although it is funny that, that uh, Royal Rumble, for example, is being sold on the Rumble match, and look at how much fucking work they're putting into JBL... JBL against John Cena. Yes! It's ridiculous. I, I'll i probably regret this, but I defy anyone to name me a more poorly built pay-per-view title match than Rhino versus Sting on Genesis. <laughs> yeah, well, good luck. To the back! We're going to be talking about the TNA Impact, uh, or the TNA Genesis pay-per-view tonight. We're going to start with Vinny here, get his thoughts on the show. For those of you just wanting the gist of it, not a good show. I, I would actually go as far as to give it a thumbs in the middle. I know some people will be shocked to hear that after they hear the review, but the Alex Shelley-Chris Saban match was quite damn great, and the Jeff Jarrett-Kurt Angle match was quite damn great. And I've seen a lot of pay-per-views that didn't have two great matches on them. So I can't go as far as to give this a thumbs down. But without those two matches, this would have been two thumbs down. Uh, this was one of the worst pay-per-views of all time, if you take out those two matches. Sure. Just 
horrible, horrible stuff up and down the show. But like I said, I, I gave the, the Shelly Saban match four stars. Three and three quarter, four stars, somewhere in that range. And the Angle Jarrett match was four and a quarter. I would guess some people would probably even go as high as four and a half. Those were two great, awesome matches. And so I can't give a show a thumbs down to have two matches like that. So, as noted, there were two excellent matches on the show. And then there was so much bad stuff that I actually started to feel bad for TNA at points during this show. That they can just be so incompetent in so many ways and have so many bad things happen to them. And many of things of, of these things, of course, are, are things that... As many of these bad things that happen to them are not accidents. Their own, it's their own it's fault. Their, it's their plan. It's not even their plan. It's just they don't know what they're doing. And it, it's almost getting to the point where... I don't know how to... I, I can't really say this without coming across as callous, but... That's never stopped you before. How do I, how do I say this? How do I say this? They're so incompetent that it borders on a mental illness. Like, retarded. <laughs> you do sound callous. Well, I mean, it's like, if, if, you, if anybody knows uh, um, someone who's retarded, someone who's legitimately mentally handicapped, you can't really get mad at them. You know what I mean? You can't get mad at them for what they do because it's the way that they are. You can get mad at somebody who, is, who has full access to all of their mental faculties, like a bad driver. You can you can get mad at a bad driver because you know if they really wanted to they could push that accelerator a little bit harder. You know what I mean? There are a lot of things that a bad driver could do to be better. These people are actually at the point of mental retardation where there's like it's it's very clear that they aren't they just don't know what they're doing. They just can't do it right. And you almost have to feel sorry for them as a result of that. We had the opener which was Jimmy Rave, Kiyoshi, Sanjay Dutt against Eric Young and LAX. I have no idea where this match came from. It was not billed in advance. It was not billed on TV. It was not billed on the website. They just put it on here. And, of course, it had to make it an elimination match as well. You can't just throw in a random six-man. No. It had to be elimination. Sure. So they did a bunch of eliminations. I missed the opening part of this match. And it came down to basically Hernandez against all three heels. And then he beat them all up, and he pinned them, and um, it was fine. I, I would give this two and a half stars, maybe two and three quarter. The crowd died when it came down to Hernandez and Jimmy Rave. Yes, they thought that the best final guy in the match to put against Hernandez would be Jimmy Rave. Nobody gave a shit. Crowd died, and uh, that was the end of the match. It was it was a fine opener, nothing more than that. The, the action all looks fine, although it did bother me when the they cut backstage, so Jim Cornette knocking on the main event mafia's door, and then it just went to the back to the ring. Nothing happened, mind you. <laughs> he was just knocking on a door. So then we had Alex Shelley and Chris Saban. No, he was actually he was looking for Rhino. Rhino was missing. Yeah, that was it, after the match. He his signer finally came out and talked to him, but. They cut backstage during the match and showed Jim Cornette knocking on a door, and then went back to the match. So anyway, he knocked on the door, and, and uh, Scott Steiner came out and said he did not know what happened to Rhino. Rhino had been in rehab a dozen times. They should go look at a gutter for him. And Cornette was not happy with this answer. He was pulling out his hair. We'll get to that more in a little bit. Alex Shelley against Chris Saban. Apparently they told these guys, go out there for 15 minutes and just have a great match. And they did. They went out there for 15 minutes, and they had a great match, and it was going along fantastically. And if you watch this show, it was pretty clear that the fans that attended this event knew the superstars and nobody else. That did not stop them from getting into this match, which is a testament to both wrestlers. They did such a great job that they got these fans into their match. So everything was going along completely great, and then Alex Shelley started selling his knee or his ankle or something like that, and Saban hesitated to make sure his friend was okay. And Saban cradled him for the pin and won the X Division title. So after all that great wrestling, that was the finish. One of the guys faked an injury and screwed his partner and won the belt. Now, if that's what you want to do, fine, I guess. But as your average person watching on at home, if you and your friend were having a match, say me and you, Vinny, and I did this and I screwed you and beat you, would you really just smile and hug me afterwards? Well, you and I are a bad example, but I had another friend of mine, for example. I'd probably be pretty upset. They were not upset at all. Saban sat there for a while, and he looked at the ground. Then he looked at Shelly. Then they both kind of smirked a little bit. 
Then they hugged. And we never heard anything about it again. Shelly hugged Saban. Saban did not hug him back. Well, he patted him on the back after the hug. I see. And they embraced. He didn't shove him away. He didn't slap him. He didn't yell at him. They just no, they did not fight. There was nothing. It was like they didn't care. So why should I care about this title? I am not going to nitpick on this. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm not even saying really there's nitpicking. I'm just going to say they gave me a great 15-minute match uh, with all kinds of insane action and, and great great athleticism and stuff. And thus, I'm not going to... Uh, but wouldn't you like to finish after all that? Well, I feel like I got one. All right. There was well, a pin. Fine. It, it may not have been the best thing they could have done, but I, there was a finish. I just figured if you're going to go all out and just have them wrestle for 15 minutes straight, just have them keep wrestling till one guy wins. Well, that would be better. I didn't understand. I'm not, I'm not going to argue that would be better. That would not be better. It would be better. But I'm not going to complain about any of this because it was great. I took a quarter star off. It's the kind of guy I am. Hirsch. Then we had a replay where Don told us we were going to watch some high spots. <laughs> I love it when he does that. We had Cornette doing a promo, and now he was announcing that Nash's doctor had called and said he had suffered a staph infection in the elbow and was risking death if he wrestled tonight. So no Kevin Nash. I presume he was doing the job. It's the only thing I can figure out here. And so did Foley, because he walked in and Cornette told him the story, and Foley thought this was bullshit. And Cornette said, no, it's real. And he said even though he didn't know what to do, he was thinking about rescheduling the match, and Foley said no. He was the executive shareholder, and the mafia had until the bell rang tonight to find a suitable replacement, or it was going to be a handicap match. Now, when I heard a suitable replacement for Kevin Nash, I laughed. What a fool! <laughs> Everything worked out in the end. You know, it's funny. My uh, friend of mine, who, who casually, occasionally watches Impact while he's doing other stuff, he noted, hey, I saw Kevin Nash in that show. And I said, yeah, he's been there for a while. My friend said, does he ever wrestle? I said, well, he wrestles more than he used to, but not a lot. He's, my friend says, because last time I saw him, he was just there saying, I'm hanging out backstage doing nothing getting paid for it. <laughs> And yeah. I said, no, no, he wrestles he, he wrestles more than he used to. In fact, he's wrestling on the pay-per-view this weekend. Fool. Fool. I'm a fool. Shane Sewell and Sheik Bashir, this is a perfect example of the fact that nobody in this crowd knew what was going on in TNA. No one was watching Impact because they didn't care at all, at all, about this match. And this actually, this was a match where they should have really thought about it and thought that, okay, this is getting over huge in the Impact Zone, so let's save it for a pay-per-view at the Impact Zone. No, they took it to Charlotte, North Carolina. Now, God bless Shane Sewell. He is a good enough wrestler, and they worked old school enough that by the end the people were getting into his comeback a bit. So that was at least good. But there were chance of boring at least two occasions during this match. There was a lot of silence. And finally at the end, the Sheik started chasing Earl Hebner in a circle, which looked horrible and then he ran into a clothesline and then Sewell got the pin with a sunset flip and then they sent out all the referees to celebrate with Shane Sewell and that was the match this was maybe two and a half stars it was yeah uh it was nothing great but I, I still love Shane Sewell and I love how old school he is and everything he did look good and uh, I, I cannot critique uh, the wrestlers really at all. All I can really critique is what they did to turn Shane Sewell from a referee into a wrestler by which I mean First, they played his hokey music, which was, I, I, I think it was supposed to be a takeoff on the Rocky theme, but it was just a, a, your typical dumb generic DNA theme. Then they showed the video, which was him in his ref gear, shaking and looking angry, and then he came out in his new gear, which was, I guess, a, a basketball jersey with referee stripes, and then black sweatpants that had referee stripes on the bottom. He looked stupid. <laughs> wow. He looked like an idiot. This was not the best outfit I've ever seen no. for a man. And uh, yes, and, and and once they got into the ring, the match was. I, I I love the match actually. I liked it more than you did, but it was it was not the best thing I ever saw. And uh, the finish was dumb. And the spot where the sheet chased the ref around her circle. And by the way, in the middle of the circle was Shane Sewell who was selling. Yeah, that spot was dumb, but. I I, I, can, I have to give you a thumbs up to the segment at all in all, just because the sheik is pretty good, and I love Shane Sewell. They. <sighs> Stuff he was wearing is like his gimmick is he's a ref, but he's not. Yeah, he's supposed to be a wrestler now. He's a wrestler now. And apparently his neck injury that caused him to retire is healed. There was absolutely no mention of it whatsoever. He just got better. We had uh, Cornette and Booker having an argument. I don't know why, but Booker grabbed him, and Shane Sewell made the save, and they had a face-off, and that was that. I don't know what this is leading to. Shane against Booker for the Legends title. 
Is Booker still the Legends champion? Is Shane Sewell a legend? I don't know. It's a mystery. We had Consequences Creed and Jay Lethal against Beer Money against Abyss and Matt Morgan for the TNA Tag Team titles. And what a what a clusterfuck this was, especially Indeed. at the finish. First off, when they came out, the announcers actually said that Lethal and Consequences had overcome the odds to win the tag titles. Really? They really said this. They <laughs> overcame the odds. They had a, a two-on-one handicap match with a crippled guy and hit him with a briefcase to win. But this was overcoming the odds in TNA. I guess that's what enormous dorks they are. They are such fabulous dorks that two-on-one is overcoming the odds. Two-on-one in their favor, by the way, for those of you that don't watch Impact. So, anyway, Rude worked the match. and Still fighting courageously through his knee injury, by the way. That's right. Jackie got in the ring right in front of the ref, and they did an avalanche spot on her in the corner, and the ref just raised his arms as if to say, what should I do? I don't know. What could I possibly do here? So then Storm fell on his back. Jackie ended up with her face in his crotch, and then Rude fell on his knees and basically humbled her. And they all sat there for a second, and then both dudes realized that they had this woman in a compromising position, and they cheered! Yes. And then all the fans cheered! <laughs> yes. And went, yay! I've seen this done before, and usually the heels realize where they are, and they get embarrassed. No. And then the fans cheer. But no, this time Robert Roode looked down where he was, and he thrust both his fists in the air at a sign of victory. Yes. Like he'd accomplished something. He's supposed to be a heel! Yes. So then we had a die spot, Morgan wiped some dudes out, and... We had a bunch of stuff. The ref was down. Basically, Rude made a cover. Lethal came off the top. Still no ref. Storm super kicked Lethal. Put Rude on Morgan. Got the pin. Got all that? I don't give a fuck. You didn't get it all. So anyway, there they was a belt uh, shot in there. put the belts on Beer Money three days after they lost them on Impact. Why did they go to all that trouble doing that long-ass match with the convoluted booking just to put the belts back on them? I don't know. A tremendous I don't question. care. A tremendous I don't question. care. Of all the things you get annoyed with here, I was most annoyed that Naomi and Matt Morgan looked like a complete geek. They kept him out of the ring forever, because uh, basically every time Abyss would try, try to tag him in, the uh, consequences and Zayn Lethal would steal a tag, and Morgan finally got in, and then they hit like two moves, and he made a cover, and then Zayn Lethal kicked him in the head. That yeah. took Morgan out. <laughs> that took Morgan out, and then the match continued. Morgan got hit with a belt, and to make a long story short, after t- taking this belt shot, he lay there for like 90 seconds, and then was finally pinned. Sure. And they're still having problems even before this occurred. And again, as I've noted many times, I don't even remember a time when they got along. So why I'm supposed to care that they're not getting along now is a mystery to me. It's a mystery. No one remembers the good old days of Matt Morgan and his best buddies. (laughs) Oh, we don't. And they could have done some fun vignettes. They could have done some awesome vignettes of them being buddies, but of course they didn't. So we had Kurt explaining to Cornette that he had killed Rhino. They all beat up Rhino and left him laying. And, of course, Rhino is supposed to be fighting for the title later. And it ended with Cornette tearing at his hair, as if to say, what could I possibly do about this? Angle had two great lines here, and and, and great may be the wrong word, but they, they entertained me. First, he said, we made Rhino an offer he couldn't refuse. Then he refused it. Yeah. This makes everyone look like a clown. Then he said they took Rhino to a field, and they beat the tar out of him, and he was sort of mentioned, we left him cab fare, though, because we're that kind of guy. Yeah. It's just, just okay. I just then. love that Cornette is his authority figure, and these guys are running wild, and he just he can't do anything about it. He's the inauthority figure. You you can't find them? You no. can't suspend them? No. You can't take the title off Sting? Nothing to be done. There was, I mean, what is Cornette? I don't even know. I don't know Apparently either. he's just a guy that yells. Jarrett also, by the way, uh, uh, and this is not great, he noted that after he beat Jeff Jarrett tonight, he was going to take over his office and then take over TNA. <laughs> what? I don't know. Where was this stuff added? I don't know. I watched Impact and I never talked about this. So then we had the Kong Taraj, which was Rocka Khan's ass, Raisha Saeed as a junior bull against ODB, Roxy, and Taylor. And it was supposed to be Kong versus Christy Hemi. But Christy has two uh, herniated discs in her neck. And she has come here to Seattle to get some sort of wacky alternative therapy that involves having her head cracked by a chiropractor or some sort of wackiness. So anyway, Kong is also hurt, and they didn't really make any mention of this whatsoever. They just made a six-woman match, which I gave minus two stars. (laughs) This was the worst match of 2009. It has got a real big head start for the rest of the year as well. This was awful. Awful, awful, awful. And... 
Kong ended up coming out after ODB won and beating her up. I have nothing more to say about this. Sometimes what I write down is a stream of conscious note-taking, and it turns out to be more accurate and funnier than anything I could say prepared. And what I wrote down for this was heat on Taylor after, well, shit, hot tag ODB, and then it falls to shit. So it started off as shitty and then went downhill. Minus two stars. This was awful. Thumbs down. God, this was bad. Just uh, there's a spot at the end where all the girls were in the ring and they just were all laying like in a heap. <laughs> I, I, I like the spot where uh, ODB is climbing to her feet and she just grabs Rock's breasts and Rock responded by licking her own wrist and ODB looks at the camera and I just thought, what are you doing? I went to the science center yesterday and there's an exhibit of naked mole rats and these are basically. They're like shaved mice that can't see or something like that. I don't know what the fuck they are. They're really ugly little beasties, and they have this in this little. They have them in this little uh, setup area that has a bunch of see-through tubes, and you can watch all these mole rats run around and act stupid. And so, of course, you have the mole rat that's trying to run backwards up the tube, and then you have the mole rat that's like asleep in the tube. So the other mole rat runs over the rat to get in front of the rat, crushing it in the process. And these mole rats are just so ungodly stupid. But you watch them and you just howl with laughter at how stupid these animals are. Just the stupidest animals you've ever seen. That was more entertaining than this match. <laughs> and maybe better coordinated. It was. It was like these, Less of a these humans were doing the same shit these mole rats were doing, and the mole rats were way more entertaining. Way more entertaining. Awful match. And then we had Sting getting asked by Borash if he why he condoned this attack of Rhino, and he said he didn't condone it, and he wasn't even involved. He said he hadn't been in Charlotte in 15 years, and he was going to fight for the title whether Rhino showed up or not. Then we had Jared versus Angle in a no-DQ match. Yes, rules are now important in TNA. So they had a match. It was fucking great. They worked at a very fast pace. There was a level of intensity in this match that you rarely see. That's These a, guys laid everything in. That's a polite way of saying they tried to kill each other. They beat the shit out of each other. They did a million stupid things. There was a spot where Angle was up on the ramp, and he was going to put Jared through a table on the floor with an Olympic slam off the ramp. And, well, Angle went to the table. Jared missed the table entirely and took an Angle slam off the ramp onto the cement on his side. When he has a hip replacement surgery procedure in 10 years, you can all look back on this match and you'll know why. They uh, were bloody. They were beaten. It's just violence like you have not seen in a TNA match, maybe in years, actually. And they ended up back in the ring. They did a whole bunch of near falls. They hit each other with chairs, all this sort of thing. And uh, finally, Jarrett ended up uh, hitting him with a chair, and Angle got both of his hands up. It was supposed to be the guitar, but the guitar broke, so he'd use a chair. And then Jarrett laid across him, and Angle uh, crucified his arms and got the pin. So same finish as Triple H and Hardy at uh, No Mercy. And three and a, or four and a quarter stars. This was an excellent match. And then afterwards, Angle beat the shit out of him and did the Pillman spot on the ankle. And Jarrett did a stretcher job. The highlight of which was after this epic, valiant performance by Jeff Jarrett, this this profoundly uh, lovable baby face or whatever it's supposed to be, uh, the fans sang the goodbye song to him as he was carted off. And I howled with laughter. It was sad, but it, I laughed as well, yes. It was great. And they did so many stupid things for two old dudes who should know better than this by now. Uh, Angle took his, his his backdrop over the ropes to the floor where he grabs the top rope and does a full flip over and lands on his feet. And uh, he's wearing wrestling shoes these days, kid, so someday he's going to blow out his, his ankle like Evan Bourne did. And then I thought, wow, that was dumb. And the next thing was uh, Jeff Jarrett launching himself over the top rope on Angle, uh, not clearing the ropes all the way and coming down on his face on the mat. That, that looked like it sucked. Then... Jared took a bell shot to the head, by which I mean Kurt Angle took up, took the bell, he unplugged it, and then he hit Jared not with a bell, but with the side of the wood the bell's attached to. And he hit him hard in the head. And I thought, wow, that's such more than the dive. And after that was a spot we mentioned where Jared went off the ramp, not through the table. And at that point, why Jared continued to wrestle, I don't know. I would have retired immediately on the spot. Screw this, I would have said. This is, I'm done. But Jeff Jared is... Uh, Apparently a tougher man than I, and he crawled to the ring, and, and actually from that point on, not only did he wrestle, but he was still awesome, and, and it, 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 they had a long, long uh, uh, 
difficult struggle just to get in the ring, the two of them, and they finally got in, and they struggled to their feet, and then they had an awesome brawl, and then the match continued. So this was great. It was uh, the opposite of the women's match. It was the best match of 2009 uh, with uh, a, a healthy head start. So then we had the main, or actually, I guess it wasn't the main not, event. Yeah. It was. By the way, if you uh, are watching this show right now, stop at this point. We had Sting and Rhino for the TNA Heavyweight Title. I was a nice guy. I gave it a star. It was bad. Worst title match I can remember in God knows how long. Nobody cared about Rhino. I mean, first off, if you watch the TV, why the fuck would anyone care about Rhino in the first place? Second, they were in Charlotte, North Carolina, so people cared about him even less. They even booed him. Sting played heel. Actually, I don't know what he played. He played babyface, but he worked a heel match. And then Rhino made a comeback, and nobody cared. And then Rhino missed a gore, and Sting uh, hit the death drop, pinned him. A nothing match. It was, uh, the, the build-up to this match was so bad that when they uh, teased that Rhino had been taken out and would not wrestle, I thought to myself, ah, that's where they didn't bother building up this match because they weren't going to deliver it in the long run anyway. I can sort of understand that. And then, no, Rhino just came out. They showed footage of him when he arrived. He was tearing up the backstage room and throwing a tantrum in his flip-flops. Terrifying. And they came out and had this match. The number one contender, flip-flops. Yes, they came out and had this match. It involved Sting applying a bear hug to Rhino for a long time. That was just about the highlight, really. And there's really nothing else to say about it. Thumbs down. And then we had a meeting or an interview with Foley, AJ, and Devon. And AJ was talking about how they were underdogs. And I was thinking... I could have sworn that at this exact moment is currently three on two your advantage. Yes. So what the fuck are you talking about? This man should not be cutting promos for his team, by the way. So he talked about how he was doing this match for Joe, and then Devon was like, Joe's your friend, but Bubba's my brother. And he said he'd vowed to do this for him. And I thought for sure Bubba was going to return and save the day and put somebody through a table and win the match. Everybody would be happy, but... Apparently that would have made too much sense, so they did something stupid. And uh, anyway, that was that, and uh, Foley said he was going to uh, take care of business. That led to Booker, Scott Steiner, and a mystery man against Foley, AJ, and Devon Dudley. The board crashed at uh, 7.50 p.m. tonight because nobody actually buys TNA pay-per-views. So when they hear something has happened, they all flood to the board to find out more details. And the story that killed the board tonight was that, yes... Cutie Kip, as Booker T called him. That's not true. Well, no. I, B- Booker T stood in the ring, and he gave a speech about finding a suitable, a suitable replacement, and then he announced, and I quote, Juki Jib. <laughs> he said, Cutie Kip, for Christ's sake. Cute Kip came out. Yes, Cute Kip was the third man on the heel team. He gave his credentials, and everybody booed him out of the building. His credentials, by the way, were all the belts he won in WWE. And A decade ago. Yeah, you know, they uh, had a match. Heat on AJ, fully tagged in, and it was very sad. Nobody cared. He made a big comeback. Everybody brawled outside, and then the bell rang. The bell rang, and they announced that both teams had been counted out. Indeed, counted out. Suddenly there were rules. I could have sworn that at the beginning of this match they brawled outside for a good 30, 40, 50 seconds. They brawled outside at the beginning for much longer than they did at this here double count out. Amazing how that works. So anyway, they got counted out here. These people just cannot do anything right. It's amazing. It's amazing. So then Cornette came out and said that he was restarting the match. So then Booker said, you don't have the power to restart the match. And then Foley grabbed the mic and said... Booker was right. Cornette didn't have the power to restart a wrestling match. Since fucking when? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and it also Cornette has held up titles. He's reversed decisions. He's made matches. He's done everything, and now he can't restart a match? I don't know. What is, where is the impact that I missed? So... Foley then, of course, said, I'm the executive shareholder. I can restart the match. It's hardcore rules. They had a hardcore match. It was pretty awful. Uh, there was a spot where AJ did a dive off the top rope, putting cute Kip through a table. The director missed most of it. Uh, Foley's leg ended up under the table, and thank God, I don't think he broke it. But... Ended up with uh, them getting in the ring. Devon nearly fell off the ropes trying, trying a diving head, but I have no idea what was wrong with him. I don't know if he got a concussion or what, but he was all wobbly. And then uh, I gave up. 
And then I just remember that Foley <laughs> pinned Scott Steiner with a DDT on a chair, and that was the end of that. This was real bad. There was a bunch of stuff going on. Yeah, I don't know what to say. It was a, it was a ten minute cluster. It was a ten minute cluster fuck of six guys doing stuff all over the building. Most of which was missed on TV because they only had the one shot. And uh, they would cut to something that had just happened. So you didn't get to see what happened. You would just see two guys lying there. And all sorts of plunder was used. Uh, the table the crowd wanted so dearly was eventually used. And they fought up the ramp and over by the guardrail. And, and they just did a bunch of stuff to kill time. And finally, at a fairly arbitrary point, they decided, let's go home. And they did. So, yes, this capped off the pay-per-view. It just, it's just like they... they, they... They did so much to build up this pay-per-view. Remember, December was the one that they just gave up on because mm-hmm. January was going to be the bigger show, right. and they devoted all these resources to building up this show, and then this is what they delivered. And then it's just like, wow! And everybody you gave the pay-per-views a try saw this. Yeah. And the, the last thing TNA, uh, T- Mike Tenay said as one of the year was, "The main event mafia won the battles with Angle and Sting winning their matches, but the front line won the war." Okay, <laughs> two questions. Jeff Jarrett was killed. Jeff Jarrett was killed dead. Uh, Rhino lost the title match. Rhino lost the title match. The, the baby face is winning six man with nothing on the line. Nothing. Uh, against a guy who was not part of the main event mafia. Yeah. There were two matches here. No, they pinned Steiner. Yeah, I was just mentioning the kid was in the match. Sure. The, uh, the, the ba- there were three matches here. The baby faces lost two of them. And uh, by winning the war, that would indicate they won't be fighting anymore. And I assure you, on Thursday, they'll be fighting again. To the back! All right. Let's uh, get going on Impact here and then uh, wrap this baby up today. We don't need this call-in information no more. Impact Impact opened with Don West telling us we're going to see AJ Styles versus Kurt Angle in one of the biggest main events in the history of Impact. I like how you just jumped into that as I was ranting there. It begs the question, if this is the biggest main event in the history of Impact, why am I just now hearing about it? Are you trying to ignore me? <laughs> Blow me off? I, for some reason, felt a strong need to get that point in there. I do, in fact, have the controls right here. I, I can end this. You can turn me down whenever you feel like it. I can end you right now. I thought maybe you'd just be happy if I showed a little backbone or a little initiative for once. Fine. They opened up with uh, them announcing this match for the show. And uh, yes, I thought, why was this? Why was there not even one interview done to explain why we're getting AJ Styles against Kurt Angle with Mick Foley as special referee in the main event tonight? No answer. Mafia came out and talked about how great they were, how they'd ended all these careers. Rhino, Bubba, Joe, BG, James, Jarrett, and the video package alerted us that they were great men, but great men are almost always bad men. That tells me something about the people writing this show. Yes. Really does. You know. Never once in my life did I think, you know, most great men are bad men. Well, there's that. And moreover, most bad men don't think they're bad men. Adolf Hitler did not consider himself the villain. Well, this didn't say bad men. It said great men. Are almost always bad men. Sure. This implies the mafia who produced this video think they are bad men. Well, maybe, I don't know. Maybe a bad asses. That could be. I don't know. This didn't make of any sense. Of all the things in the show to pick on, that's what you chose? You're choosing great men are almost always bad men? Well, sure. That's just a fallacy. And it's not a fallacy that the, the main event mafia actually picture themselves as the heels. Well, they do. They do. <laughs> They've actually said it. I see. We're the bad guys. All right, then. So, then we had a... Then we had... Angle saying, took out Jeff for good, said he and Sting won their battles at the pay-per-view, but thanks to Foley, they didn't win the war. I have no idea what war they're talking about. I I recall a six-man wrestling match. We had this exact same discussion at the end of the pay-per-view show. Fans chanted for Foley, and Angle said he didn't care about Mick, because tonight they have Mick and and AJ in the ring at the same time, and they have a multiple hit. There's also a point somewhere in this segment where the director cut to a fan who was holding up a sign, except he cut to the fan just as he was putting the sign down. Sure. This show was not live. No. Edited. <laughs> Edit this crap. So then they showed, as noted, Hernandez coming out, and Shane Sewell's there as the ref for no reason. No reason. He's just a ref again. Days after being fired. Right. Fired as a referee and hired as a wrestler. Now he's just inexplicably back as a referee. So Hernandez wanted his shot against Sting, 
Shane Sewell refereed the match. Are they really thinking that not a single fan turned to their friend and said, why is Shane Sewell refereeing? I don't know. Do they really think not a single person thought of that? What are they? I just don't understand. I don't either. Assholes. I don't understand anything about this segment. Assholes. So Sting worked like a baby face but still got the heat. Three minutes later, Hernandez made a comeback, and the Mafia interfered for the DQ. Just jaw jumped in and killed him. Yeah. And uh, it has now, I guess, been established that Jim Cornette does not have the power to restart matches. But where the fuck's Mick Foley? Don't know. And I, 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 I don't know if I mentioned this with uh, on the Dave show or if I mentioned it here or where I mentioned it, but uh, there's a reason nobody gives a shit about this briefcase deal. It's like we mentioned many times that TNA is low rent. Their briefcase deal is like a, a, a complete ripoff of Money in the Bank. Yes. I mean, no two ways about it. Mm-hmm. They're ripping off Money in the Bank. Right. All right, fine. If you're going to blatantly rip off Money in the Bank, at least try to do it better. Oh, yes, sir. Or, or even as good. Money in the Bank every year is either a title change. If it's not a title change, it's big news that it wasn't a title change. Ken Kennedy. Oh, yeah. And it's always, no matter what, a main event angle. A it's big, major turning point Indy. in the company. And it's always a top deal. And, and it's usually, with Kennedy being the exception, a guy wins money in the bank, and it automatically elevates him. We saw it with Edge. We saw it with Rob Van Dam. We saw it with uh, Punk, who was then de-elevated later, but still. Here, some guys won the tag shot. They won the belts, and they lost them three days later. They're right back where they started. Hernandez got a shot, got a three-minute match in the opener on Impact. Right. Didn't got, even, not even a pay-per-view, not even a main event of Impact, but not even a pay-per-view main event. No. And there was no build for it. No. So if you did not know uh, beforehand he was getting the shot, if you're a Hernandez fan, too bad. Impact, he lost it in three minutes via disqualification. It was never mentioned again. And in fact, you get a rematch? No. Doesn't nope. get a match restarted. He's just her homicide. Gone. Home, he's just homicide tag team partner again. Now that's annoying enough. Eight million things then happened. So Hernandez wins by DQ. He's not the champion. He's the victim of a four on one beating. Shane Sewell and Booker T get in a fight. And Sewell this was actually up, the only part I hated. Sewell ends up dumping Booker T, and he's left there holding the Legends title and staring down Booker T. Meanwhile, eight feet to his right. Hernandez is still getting beaten three on one. Yeah. Sewell does nothing. 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 Homicide runs out. He runs wild for a bit until Booker T. You're actually missing the key point of they sent out a bunch of referees who just stood outside the ring and pointed at the ring. (laughs) This all happened. They didn't actually get in the ring to break it up. No. They surrounded the ring and pointed their fingers at the ring as if to say, stop doing that now. Right. So I'm I'm going to just. That's important, by the way. That's very important. So, So Hernandez is beaten four on one. Sewell and Booker T have a fight. Rest run out. Homicide runs out. He runs wild. He is cut off. He is killed. AJ runs out. He is cut off. This is where I wrote, I hate the show. Well, I, I didn't hate it because the whole point of that was they kept sending out guys, and the guys kept getting beat up, and it was all a big setup for Bubba to return. That was fine. I had no problem with that. The only thing I really had a problem with was that stupid Sewell part. They wanted to shoot an angle with Shane Sewell, and they did it as a beating is going on in the ring in another corner of the ring. <laughs> that was yes. so goddamn stupid. That was really, really stupid. And, and then finally Bubba did it. Yes, the, Team 3D, led by the uh, newly Mohawk Bubba Ray Dudley, made their giant return, and they finally cleared the ring and then perk her through a table because the angle just had to have one more bit going on. And they had an angle had to sell it like this power bomb through a table, seriously injured him and prevented him from wrestling the rest of the night. Yeah. So that went forever and drove me crazy. It's just amazing that I don't know. That 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 violent, vicious match with Kurt Angle and Jeff Jarrett on Sunday. An angle's totally fine here. But yeah. a power bomb through a table and he's just in, incapacitated. Among many other things from the pay per view, he went through a table off off the stage. Yes. He on did. the concrete. He did. This was Threw a table off of Bubba Ray's shoulders, threw a table to the mat. Yes, but this incapacitated him. Right. So then after commercial, Devon did a promo about how they needed to prove they could be singles competitors. He said that had never been seen before, and I thought, it has. Reverend Devon, it fucking sucked. <laughs> but anyway, he said he wanted, I believe, Angle, 
and then Bubba did a promo and said he wanted Sting. And uh, why did he want Sting, by the way? Because Let me he's explain. a champion? No. He said all the other Mafia members beat him up, but Sting just stood there. He said Sting knew this was wrong, but he didn't do anything, and that made him worse than the other guys. Because you see, if you know something's wrong and you don't do anything, that's worse than if you know something's wrong and you do it. I, I don't know. I don't know. This is what he said. I know. <laughs> he is more angry at the guy that stood there and did not attack him than all the men that beat him with two-by-fours and put him in a dumpster. The guy that did nothing is more of a criminal to him. Yeah. I, I don't understand. All I know is when this is all said and done, uh, we were left. Uh, apparently, in the next pay-per-view, we're going to get Devon versus Kurt Angle, Bubba Ray versus Sting for the title, and Hernandez is just back down from the bottom. So you're telling me that if, if I was at the bank and a robber came in and pulled out a gun and put it up to the bank teller's head and said, I'm going to kill you, and then killed the bank teller, I'm supposed to be more angry at a bystander that stood by and watched than the guy that pulled the trigger? That's what I'm being told by Bubba here. I think you're right. That's you're, what he said. You're, you're putting too much thought into this. It's just stupid. It Didn't is. you say I want to win the title from you, you cock? You would think so. So The good news is both men had really awesome delivery. The bad did. news is what they said blew. That's right. So then we had the beautiful people going to sign some documents saying they were going to the inauguration. Cute Kip, who was a badass main event wrestler on Sunday, is now back to being a gay hairdresser. No explanation whatsoever. No. The Mafia wasn't even mad at him for anything at the pay-per-view. No. The Mafia just didn't even care. No. N not even mentioned. I was just saying, I don't think they even mentioned he, he was in the main event on the show. No. So if you didn't watch the show, which most of the people watching didn't, they have no idea. So he tried to tell them this was a rib, and they told him to get over himself, and he said, fine, you two chicks are on your own tonight. I thought he d d deserted them weeks ago. <laughs> I think he's walked out of this angle like four times. So then they showed footage of the Jarrett match and said he had injured ribs, contusions to the kidney, grade one concussion, and more. Yeah, and this is prefaced by uh, Mike Tanay and Don West in front of a blue screen with the crowd behind them. Yeah. And it, it looked really hokey and it made me laugh. I guess that's good. Yeah. You know, uh, our king, Jimmy Lasers, has gone on and on. He's trying to, he's trying to, I don't know what he's trying to do, but he's, he keeps, he keeps bringing up that the announcers are not facing the ring. And I think he's, he's, he's trying to make fun of me, essentially. By by pointing out that I nitpick things, and thus it would be awfully nitpicky to to note how stupid it is for the announcers not to face the ring when they do commentary. And in reality, uh, it's a good thing when you don't face the ring to do commentary. Because the idea is that you're looking at a monitor, mm -hmm. and the monitor is showing you what the people at home are seeing. Right. So it is a handicap to be facing the ring because you can get caught up in the action and watch the ring and not be talking about the things that the people are seeing at home. So, uh... Fail, my king. Fail. Anyway, we had the doctor telling Angle he couldn't wrestle. He was mad. Beautiful people came out with the fake Sarah Palin, and she had told them that she they had passed every test, and they were going to be at the inauguration next Tuesday, and gave them a document to sign to make it official. We never found out what this document was, by the way. Maybe there's more to come, although they've taped two weeks of TV and, and no mention of it. So out came Taylor and Roxy. Taylor called them, and I quote, dumb B. Oches here in 2009 and said that uh, they'd been spending six months trying to find a way to get even with them for embarrassing the knockouts division. They claimed they were real wrestlers while the beautiful people were, I guess, fake wrestlers with fake noses, fake boobs, etc. Now, first off, Taylor Wilde has fake tits, so what so the fuck is she talking yes. about? And uh, second off, Angelina Love... <laughs> Now, now, granted, Velvet Sky is not the best wrestler I've ever seen, but Angelina Love. Mm -hmm. So anyway, now, they, uh, uh, here's the other thing. Well, go, go ahead and see how this ended. They said they were not divas, which apparently is is uh, low rent. They were knockouts, not divas. Knockouts. What does the term knockout even even suggest? Beautiful people. <laughs> right. 
Yeah, anyway, so anyway, they uh, they talked about how they were two dumb blondes and there was no inauguration, no meeting the president. That wasn't even the real Sarah Palin. And then they said punking them was not fun enough. It was time for them to get mucked. And then stuff fell from the ceiling and covered them. And that was what we waited all of these weeks that was for. All the six that weeks of Bill was the big, yeah. Like a, a two months because when like, since the actual election, didn't it? To get to this point, that's what it led to was they put dirt on the beautiful people. Now, theoretically, the payoff here should be we're happy to see the beautiful people get humiliated, right? That's sure, what, that's what the fans. And uh, there was no real reason here. They never really did anything. Mostly they just entertained us and were hot. So Taylor Wilde had to come out and tell us why we were supposed to hate the beautiful people. It's because they wear makeup and have fake boobs and wear slutty clothes, apparently. Yeah. Little tip about most wrestling fans. They like girls in slutty clothes with makeup and fake boobs. Yeah. <laughs> that would make the beautiful people faces here. Yeah. And they can wrestle. And they can wrestle, and they're entertaining, and they have their interests that everyone loves. This was an utter failure. In every way. It infuriated me. <laughs> it was long. I didn't even care, because I knew it was going to be stupid. I... <laughs> Do you really think you were going to get a good payoff to this? No, but I re- I knew how much time. I, I I guess in total it wasn't more than fifteen minutes, but we had to see had to see multiple angles of this stuff for weeks now. And, and, and I, you thought you'd get something good at the end. I would have rather they just stopped it, well, and the beautiful people just came out, and there was no mention of Sarah Palin. Too bad. We had and, the... and, and by the way, we're all st- all supposed to believe that Angelina and Velvet not only really thought this was Sarah Palin. I, I had come to grips with that part. They also believe that she really had won the election. Yeah. Yeah. Bullshit. Yeah. This you is why, ridiculous. Between this and the, the, the whole opening deal, this is why I called it a flaming turd of a TV show. The Contourage did a promo. Sojo Bolt is her new name, and she did all the talking. And then we got a rough cut with her, and unlike every other rough cut, where they take, like, the number one heels in the tag team division and portray them like baby faces by telling their real story. She played heel in a rough cut. Yes. It was so wacky. That helps. But, yeah, she, she did a rough cut where she made it abundantly clear that uh, she, was ta- she mentioned something about people like us, and she looked at Raka and then at Kong and said, you know what I mean? Make it abundantly clear that the black women are heels. I see. And then she uh, mentioned that uh, she, she called, I think it was Taylor Wilde, she called a Barbie doll and, oh no, it was Lauren, who was right there with the microphone. She called her a Barbie doll and said she would treat her the way they did in the ghetto and show her how it was done in the ghetto. And uh, if you're going to be a character from the ghetto, you should speak like, for example, JTG. I believe JTG's from the ghetto. So she spoke with, in, 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 with perfect English, enunciating everything very clearly, and then talked about What are you her- saying here? I'm saying ghetto characters, Brian, should speak in a different dialect than other people. People not from the ghetto. I'm just going to turn myself down. You can turn yourself down. I'm myself dig my own hole here. So then after talking about her, her ghetto childhood, she then said in the rough cut right away, I had a great childhood. <laughs> wow. She went through some tough times. Are you, are, you, are you finished? I'm done. With your racial tirade here? I, I guess. Taylor and Roxy and ODB against Raisha, Raka, and Sojo Bolt. We really needed a rematch, apparently. Somebody watched the pay-per-view, and of all the matches on the pay-per-view, thought, you know which one would play well in the Impact Zone? Not Shane Sewell and, and uh, the Terrorist. How about this one here? So we got this one again, and uh, it was a whole different level of terrible from Sunday. It was it was terrible, terrible match, but terrible in a very different way from Sunday. I don't even know how to explain that, but it was just horribly bad. Raka got pinned for about the 18th time. Fire her or do something with her. I don't. So Sojourner Bolt took uh, so they took one of the baby faces to her corner, and she turned to Raka and she held up her hand. Nothing happened for like three seconds. And finally, Sojourner screamed, "Tag!" And Rocka did. Later, we got a hot tag to Roxy, and we got the Roxy versus Rocka Khan battle. My God! This is some bad, bad Horrible. pro wrestling. 
Uh, they got the heat in ODB at one point, and there was a. Why are we still talking about this match? Because there's so much horrible things to talk about. ODB, there was a. She got the, the other heat on her. Then they did the double KO spot leading to the hot tag. She had to fire herself up. She fired herself up. I'm not making this up by masturbating. <laughs> yeah, that's actually true. She pawed herself right she there. She rubbed on the her vagina, and this inspired her to make the hot tag. Yeah. Right. Then we had the Booker meeting with Angle. And telling him to relax. Also dropped the term the Dudleys. We had the announcement during a commercial. This is actually great. UFC 91 with Lesnar and Couture is going to be replaying January 24th at 9 o'clock p.m., which, by absolute pure coincidence, just happens to be head-to-head with Affliction. So there really? you go. <laughs> yeah. That's shocking. That's odd. Jay Lethal and Consequences Creed against Morgan and Abyss. Number one contenders match. Winners getting a shot at beer money at the pay-per-view. And apparently the Money in the Bank briefcase does not come with rematch clauses in those contracts because, you know. Now they have to earn a shot. You have to earn your shot after you get pinned. So the finish, which I'm sure sounded good on paper, Abyss accidentally powerbond lethal onto his own partner. And that Morgan was pinned. Right. And then afterwards they broke up, and uh, the refs ran down to break it up. And the reason I mentioned earlier about the referees was, here the refs actually got in the ring to break it up. Whereas at the beginning of the show, they just stood outside the ring and pointed. They can't even have consistency in ref breakups on this program. No. They can do nothing right. Now, we, we, we argued about this finish. When I can buy that when Matt, when, uh, when uh, Abyss is doing a powerbomb, all he can see is his opponent's belly, and thus he may not know his partner's there. I'm more offended by the fact that the 7-foot, 300-pound Matt Morgan had a 150-pound man dropped on him and was incapacitated. Yes. He could not get up. No. Then we had uh, Cornette meeting with Angle and uh, talked about the main event, said the Mafia could pick a replacement to face AJ. Steiner Booker got in an argument and started to do eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Swear to God. Swear to God. Yes. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. I laughed. Cornette told him to shut up, put Steiner in the match, and then he said if anyone interfered, they'd be fined and such. Now, all of a sudden, he's he's threatening fines. And you know what happened when he threatened the fine? All the guys told him to fuck off. Yes. And I was, and he just raised his hands and walked out. <laughs> How could anybody like this show? I don't know. Well, I don't. I, I laughed at Eeny Meeny Miny Mo and laughed even harder when they argued about who got to be Eeny. Then we had Foley doing a promo saying this eeny, meeny, miny, mo stuff was bullshit. This was serious business. He said he wasn't asking. He was begging the mafia to get involved tonight. And by the way, Foley is ref. First off, they billed him as a special referee. He ended up being the outside the ring enforcer, number one. Number two, in the middle of the match, uh, he went to check on the ref who had taken a bump, and Scott Snyder hit him with a pipe and incapacitated him. You challenged the entire mafia to come out, and one guy with a pipe put you out of action. Yes. So then... Then he put on the sock, which I don't even think they, they got a good angle of it. All of a sudden, there's just so Foley running around with his sock on his hand. And he tries to get in the ring, and the other ref stops him, the ref, from getting in the ring. Right. And then Petey Williams, all 140 pounds of him, runs down and gives Steiner a drop kick off the top. AJ hits a Pele kick. And uh, AJ, by the way, had kicked out of a shot with a steel pipe moments earlier. And Scott Snyder gets pinned with a drop kick by a diminutive man and a Pele kick. Right. There's <laughs> one one key detail you leave me out of all this. You mentioned that uh, there was a ref bump, and then Mick Foley was taken out with a pipe shot, and then there more stuff happened. What you're missing is there was like five minutes of wrestling in between that. Mick Foley got hit with a pipe, and then just rolled outside and got better. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> These people don't know what they're doing. I hated Have the I show. Have I mentioned that before? I fucking hated the show. It's so bad, it's hilarious, actually. I, 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 I'm so, not even offended this week. No, I was angry, and I kept... I kept every time you... This you, is you, Penguins you, hitting the window. Every time you hit the fast-forward button and we see how much time was left, I kept thinking, we have to be farther along than that. No. The DVR must be screwed up. But no, the show kept going. So the show ended with the announcer saying the front line was stronger than ever. Apparently because of the addition of P.D. Williams. Right. P.D. Williams and Team 3D are back, and Kevin Nash is out with a bad elbow, so now it's like 18 on 4. Well, Jeff Jarrett and Samoa Joe are gone, but now that P.D. Oh, Williams is true. back, that's they're true. stronger than ever. I guess it, there's a mitigating factor there. To the back! Impact. Impact, everybody. 
let's take a look at this fucker here. Impact opened with pork. It did. They're, they they scan they scan the crowd and they found a sign that said pork, and they zoomed in on it. <laughs> and they focused on it. Why? I don't know. I don't know either. But it was a sign that said pork, and apparently the director thought, hmm, this is very important to alert all of the viewers that a man in the impact zone has a sign that says pork. So fine job, Keith Mitchell, or whatever your fucking name is. We had Alex Shelley, Chris Saban, the guru, and the terrorist. And this this was where I was ready to hate the show, passionately. <laughs> First off, it's a four-way. Second off, the ref was Shane Sewell. That's right. Shane Sewell is not only back as a referee. We at least got an explanation this week. The explanation was Mike Tanay nonchalantly mentioning that he had been reinstated as a ref. That is the extent of it. <laughs> I actually missed that. That is the complete extent of the explanation for why Shane Sewell is back as a ref. Because he's been reinstated. As a ref. Now, not only is he back as a referee, but he was a referee in a match with Sheik Bashir. Right. What? <laughs> because... It gets worse. Yeah. It gets worse. Not only is he back refereeing a match with Sheik Bashir... But the reason they had the tournament at the last pay-per-view to climax with the crowning of a new X Division title was because of bullshit involving Shane Sewell and the Sheik. Right. This, meanwhile, was an X title match. Right. With Shane Sewell and the Sheik involved. Uh Uh-huh. What a fucking stupid group of assholes. (laughs) Yeah. So, that made me mad. And then Charmel came out in the middle of this. Because we needed more people. Yeah. And... Basically, they wanted us to remember the issue at the pay-per-view, which was seen by 20,000 people, where Booker and Shane Sewell had a face-to-face. They wanted us to remember that, but they did not want us to remember the months-long feud between Shane Sewell and Sheik Bashir. Correct. I hate these people. So, Shelly pinned Dutt. and as soon as it was over, Charmel said Booker wanted to see Sewell in his locker room. By the way... I would just like to say right here that uh, at the pay-per-view, I was very upset after the Alex Shelley-Chris Saban match due to the fact that Alex Shelley fucked his partner and beat him to win the title, and they weren't even angry about it. Chris Saban was not even upset about it. And what happened the next day on the board, people were yelling at me saying, Brian, why do you assume they're not going to have a follow-up? Why do you assume they're not going to do anything? They very well may do something on TV. Okay, there's now been two shows. They've done nothing with it. I was right. And by the way, as we discussed in ECW, John Morrison pinned the Miz clean after Finley hit him with a move. Miz was still ornery. Yeah. You pinned me, you fucker. Saban did not even care. No. So, there you go, everybody. Nothing. It was not followed up on, just as I had predicted. Now, we had Booker meeting with Sewell and telling him, basically, that he wanted him to help them win their match later on. And well, uh, he, said, he told him there was a tag match between Booker and Scott Steiner versus Eric Young and Petey Williams. And Booker told Shane Sewell that it was important that it come down to Booker and Scott alone with Petey. Okay, fine. They want to beat him up two-on-one, so they want the ref to get rid of Eric Young somehow. That's fine. What happened in that match? Nothing. They just beat him up and pinned him. <laughs> The ref was not involved in any way. We'll get to that match later. Angle came out and did a promo and made fun of Petey, made fun of AJ, said they were both going to be beaten up tonight, and said that uh, ran down Team 3D, said, who made you bookers? A fine question. Said, uh, you could take your challenges for the pay-per-view, the two singles matches, and shove them up your fat asses. Said there was no way he was wrestling Devon, no way uh, Sting was wrestling Bubba, and then Sting then grabbed the mic and said, let me speak for myself. With all due respect, nobody is going to tell me who I can and cannot wrestle. And Angle got pissed, and they started whispering to each other off the mic. And then Cornette came out, and uh, this was awesome. He said, Team 3D does not have the authority to book matches, but I do. So he can book matches, but he can't restart matches. I, I'm done, yes. I, I'm done talking about it. But hold on a second. Isn't restarting a match booking a match? If you think about it, it's booking an immediate rematch, yes. So he can book matches but not restart matches? Brian, it makes no sense. They're fucktards. You're only going to make your brain bleed. God, I hate this place. It's fucking dumb. It's so stupid. This is a good show. 
This is a good show, but it's shit. God, the Observer Awards this year just brought me such joy. Just brought me such joy. TNA was skewered in these awards. Just fucking skewered and cooked over an open flame. And what were you expecting? Not this much of a skewering. I see. I, I expected them to not do well, but they did horribly. Voted like worst show. They were. All sorts of bullshit. You should have been unanimous. It, well, <laughs> there's, there's been some bad shows, don't get me wrong. But So anyway, I, I felt very justified by the, the skewering, the, the raising of TNA in the, in the awards this year. But So anyway, he uh, announced that it was now going to be Sting, Angle, Booker, and Devon at the pay-per-view, where the first person to get a pinfall was a world champion. So if... For example, Devon pins Bubba, then Devon's the champion. Which uh, would be a brotherly thing to do, if you think about it. God, this is so stupid. In fact, Corden actually said the best way to win one of these matches is to work together as a team and then have one of you lay down for the other. Why would you pay money to see this? I wouldn't. Why would anybody? I don't know. What is wrong with TNA fans? (laughs) That's a great question. I mean, seriously. So, then uh, then we had Lauren interviewing Petey. And uh, this was also stupid. I can tear apart every single segment on what was a good TNA show. Petey did a promo about how this thing with Scott Steiner was personal, and he was going to beat him up tonight. Now, for those of you that don't recall, Scott Steiner and Petey Williams were a team. And Petey was little Papa Pump. And so Petey cut all of his hair off, he dyed it blonde, he put chain mail on, He grew a goatee and bleached it blonde, so he looked like a miniature version of Scott Steiner. They worked together as a team, and then a couple of months ago, the the main event mafia beat the shit out of Petey, supposedly killed him, he was left for dead, we didn't see him for two months, so here he was in his first appearance back, second appearance, I guess he returned last week, but he's back here after uh, been beaten unmercifully by his friend two months earlier, Goatee bleached. Right. Hair bleached. Uh-huh. Wearing chain mail. Yes. <laughs> Why would he change, Brian? Just because he had been stabbed in the back by the man he was idolizing. <laughs> Maybe they'll have a, a... This will all lead to a feud where the loser has to, has to not wear chain mail anymore. It's so goddamn stupid. Speaking I mean, of think stupid... About, let's just... I mean, think about this like it's real, okay? Like a week ago, he went to the fucking barber shop. Yeah. He said... Cut my hair short and bleach it. Right. And bleach my, my goatee. A stripe in my beard, yes. Yeah, put a stripe there, like Scott Steiner. Oh, being Scott? Yeah, he beat the fucking fuck out of me with a pipe and killed me. But, but did seriously do this for me? Why? Because he's dumb. Why would you do this? Because he's a stupid baby face. He also said, and I have no idea what this has to do with anything, but he said if you have one leg in tomorrow and one leg in yesterday, then you're pissing on today. I have no idea what this means. I have no idea why I should care. <laughs> I have no idea how this made television. Maybe I had to do with his cock flap. We'll get to that later, too. Why was Petey Williams looking like Scott Steiner? Someone explain this to me. And, and by the way, he's had two or three months to think about this. That's the point I'm trying to make, dumbass. He wakes up every day. At least in the mirror. Says, exactly. I look like Scott That's Steiner. That's what I'm trying to say, for fuck's sake. Why is he still looking like him? It's not like he was beat up yesterday. No. He's had to continually upkeep his look. Yes. God, this place is stupid. Speaking of stupid. Today interviewed Bubba and Devon in Japan. From do, Japan. How do we know when they were in Japan? Well, they were at a desk and there was a flag behind him with a red circle on it. Yes. That's how we knew. That's how we knew it was in Japan. And we, our, our, our non-wrestling fan friend was watching this for about... Eight seconds and said, are they supposed to be in Japan? And he said, yes. And cackling ensued sure, at le- this cheap set. A legit shoot cackling. So they, they talked via satellite. They talked about winning the IWGP tag belts, which they had there. And they got the news about the singles matches being turned down for the pay-per-view, and instead it would be a four-way. And Bubba was surprised and, and I, I guess upset. He wanted to know who booked this, and they said Jim Cornette. And they said, well, that's okay. And they... Started talking. At this point, TNA got... I guess they wanted to prove they were in Japan. Prove it was via satellite. Prove it was via satellite. And, and by had, the way, what is what a hokey-ass satellite feed this looked like. <laughs> yeah, so they wanted to prove they were in... 
their, uh, in Japan via satellite, and they did this by making their own equipment look shoddy and cheap. Yeah, they, they, the satellite malfunctioned. We couldn't hear them. They cut back to the announcers. Don looked <laughs> like a Muppet. He looked like a Muppet, didn't he? <laughs> he, to me, even more so. Don West was the befuddled Muppet. He he was like two Muppets that are sitting up in the theater. Statler and Waldorf. Yeah. No, that, I back to Paris because those guys had that together. Don was Quasi Bear, <laughs> just perplexed, looking around, confused. And uh, my name was Sam the Eagle, pointing sternly at the camera, saying, "We'll be right back." <laughs> and then we cut to Bunsen Honeydew. <laughs> You haven't gotten to use that in a while, have you? No. Bunsen Honeydew interviewed Sting about the four-way, and Sting told him to stop stirring up shit. He said they were going to move forward. They then gave Steiner a mic, who cut a nonsensical promo, and uh, who cares? All I know is th- this is where Booker T's uh, said respect over and over again. Which you completely forgot. He's an asshole. But then, more importantly, this is where Scott Steiner referred to Peter Williams as make-believe muscle. <laughs> yes. Now, what an irony. That is funny. <laughs> That is a funny, funny name. Then we had another rough cut with Sojourner Bolt, and then we got her in a match with ODB, hilariously bad. And ODB made a comeback. Kong ran in for the DQ. Rock and Raisha ran down, and Roxy and Taylor made the save. And uh, this was a bad segment of professional wrestling on television. We tried to get our friend to come on the show and just share her thoughts on this entire segment. Not happening. She refused, but she watched this match, and about halfway through she just says, isn't the idea to make them look cute? <laughs> you think? I just said, well, that's they're trying, they're trying the best. And I said, well, that's all you can really do with ODB. And she asked, I am not making this up. She asked, then why would you hire her? <laughs> and I said, I don't know. No one knows. And we had the blonde interviewing the fake Sarah Palin, and the beautiful people ran in and beat the holy piss out of her. Yes, they did. And all I learned during this segment was the impact zone is a dump. <laughs> We were cutting this promo, and when they attacked her and moved her six feet to the left, there was piles of wood there, there was metal beams, there was construction equipment. It was all in progress of being made. And this went forever. Uh, security ran in to break it up, and then Cute Kip beat him up. So hell of a security crew you've got <laughs> yeah, here. Yeah, beat up by one guy. And then uh, Kip told the girls they'd done enough damage and they should knock it off, and that was the end of the segment and the last we ever saw of anybody here. Wow. Wow. What a what a what a epilogue to the whole Sarah Palin thing right there. She got beat up. So uh, it is that classic TNA though, where where the whole Sarah Palin deal was designed to humiliate two girls, and then after the two girls got humiliated, they had to beat up the girl that humiliated them. So all the women in this entire segment were in some way beaten or humiliated. Hello, Vince Russo. Indeed, indeed. Can't this guy just go to a fucking whorehouse or something like that? And you know what I mean? Christ. Then we had Booker and Steiner against Eric and Petey, and uh, we, this is where we learned that TNA sucks. Well, that too, but specifically for this reason, this was an elimination tag team match. You had the main event mafia against the front line, two on two, but it was an elimination match. Why? I have no idea. None. Why? So what happened was Booker pin Young. With the axe kick after they just beat the shit out of him. (laughs) Like in a tag match, they just killed him. They got the heat on him without a tag, and they pinned him without a tag. Yeah. So he looked like an idiot. That was two heels against Petey. He got a little bit of a comeback here and there, but then they killed him. They hit finishers on him repeatedly, kept lifting him up at two, and then Booker hit another axe kick for the pin. A fucking complete burial. (laughs) Just a complete burial. They were jobbers, yes. And uh, then... uh... Somewhere in here, Booker T was upset at Shane Sewell. I don't know why. He did his job. Well, he... Shane Sewell was mad that they kept lifting him up. And so Booker was offended that he was mad and beat I him up. I see. Okay. Anyway, so, so that was that. Happened. And this is where, uh, yes, our, our our friend, her comment, her question on this match was, why, referring to Petey Williams, is he wearing a <laughs> penis flap but no butt flap? <laughs> and our best guess was just that he couldn't afford two flaps. He's too poor. He's yes. an indie worker. He's a TNA undercard guy. He can't afford a flap over his ass and over his cock. I just figured that he did a lot of squats but had a small penis. So he had part of his glutes. Yeah, so he had I to see. cover his cock but not his ass. That makes sense. That's my theory. So then we had the uh, Abyss and Matt Morgan interviewed by the blonde in the ring. So you knew there was trouble. So... She said last week Morgan took out his patience on Abyss. 
Again, this show's not live. No, it's not any good either. He said he had a bad temper problem, and the people cheered. <laughs> he said his temper had cost him NFL and NBA contracts. So he said he lost out on the NBA, the NFL, and uh, other wrestling organizations. He was crappy attitude. And then he said, worse, <clears throat> I lost my best friend last week due to my attitude. At which point, the crowd, in the most mocking manner possible, went, ah. And he looked at him like, that wasn't supposed to be that funny. <laughs> so then he said he had to apologize. He kept calling him Abby. Perhaps because of his six-pack. I, I don't was know. going to say, aren't you the one with the abs? So he offered a handshake. Everybody booed. They hugged. Abby said he also had a bad problem. They should go to therapy together. He hugged the blonde. He said he got his best friend Matt back. So, of course, that led to beer money against Abyss and Matt Morgan in a first blood match. A first blood match, you say? I can't even believe that I I thought this was a good show. I mean, <laughs> per TNA standards, this was a good show, but looking back at it, every goddamn single segment sucks. Yes. So they had this match, which, first off, why is it a first blood match? God only know. knows, because they had to have a wacky stipulation. So they're doing this little match here, and uh, anyway, I'll, I'll just tell you what happened. At the end, Morgan grabbed a chair, and he just whacked Abyss, and Abyss bled. So Matt cost himself the match, and I guess the titles, and broke up with his friend. And the reason it was so goddamn stupid was it wasn't even like a horseman beatdown where, like, one guy's on the apron waiting for the tag, waiting for the tag, waiting no, for the tag, and no. he finally gets the tag and then turns on his partner. This was, Matt Morgan was trying to win this match yeah. for 99% of it. <laughs> for like eight minutes. There was no moment where Abyss accidentally hit him. No. It was just all of a sudden, he grabbed a chair, he swung it at the heels, the heels both ducked, and so he swung it at his fat, slow friend and hit him. I hate Vince Russo. This was a bad swerve, and I'll tell you why. A good swerve is when you don't see it coming. A. -A. But when you look back, it makes sense. Yes. You're like, oh, you know, I didn't see that coming, but fuck, that makes perfect sense. Right. That is a good swerve. This was the worst kind of swerve imaginable in that you knew what was coming, and it still made no sense. No. There wasn't a person in the crowd that thought that Matt Morgan was not going to turn on Abyss. And he turned on the on Abyss for absolutely no reason. I don't know why. How can a person... Now, I realize Vince Russo is an idiot. But he has now been around this business uh, for over a decade. A long effing time. How can you be so goddamn dumb after all these years? I, I really don't get it. I mean, even like... Even, like, a person that has no understanding of wrestling is not an athlete and it's just horrible. You put him in the ring for ten years and, you know, competent, maybe. They'll pick up something. I mean, Billy Gunn's horrible, but he's not like, you know, he's not a uh, he's not a, a guy that's, like, on the first day of wrestling school no, still. There's a difference between... Vince Russo is, hasn't even started booking school. He's so fucking stupid. That he's not even at that level yet. He's not even at the level of, of a guy just starting out. He's below that level. It's, it's just amazing. And it's been a decade can, and a half. You can be around this for so long and still be so awful at what you do. It just amazes me. So that was fucking retarded. So then we had, uh, oh, on the bright side, uh, when Morgan did hit Abyss with the chair shots, they were the lightest chair shots I've ever seen. And I have no problem with that whatsoever. So way to go, Morgan. Then we had Angle and AJ in a table match and... Uh, you know, I, I, right before that, they had a clip with a uh, Abyss was being led to the ambulance, and he went crazy. He overturned a table. He knocked over the camera guy, and uh, they come back to the desk, and Don West says, "Well, Abyss has been on edge lately. Lately, lately, his gimmick is that he's crazy. Yeah, well, lately he's really been on edge since he's gotten therapy. Angle and AJ tables match. They can't have a bad match. It was uh, good stuff. There was more. There was over, there was over a half hour of wrestling on this show, so that was at least an improvement. That must be why That's we probably, didn't hate it. Yes, yeah, probably why I didn't hate this show like I usually do. But as noted, every segment did have a lot of idiocy in it. But they had a, a pretty good match here, and then all of a sudden AJ came off the top, and uh, a, uh, Angle moved, and AJ bonked into the table like a fool, and then Angle gave him an Olympic slam through the table and won. Just beat him clean. What a burial! <laughs> So, for those keeping track, the front line was fucked in the ass tonight on impact. 
And Angle then put the chair around AJ's ankle and pillmanized it. All right. So we now have, and they listed this, Samoa Joe is out. Jeff Jarrett is out. Uh, they took out P.D. Williams, but he's back. They took out Bubba Ray, but he's back. And now AJ is out. And all I can Now think- AJ better be out for like six months. Because the Pillman ankle spot was, was uh, it was a spot where whenever you put a, a chair around someone's ankle, everyone really freaked out. Yeah. Because they thought this was a potential career ender. Yeah. They start stomping on people's feet in a chair every week and it ain't going to mean a fucking thing. No shit. <laughs> You're preaching the choir here, buddy. It's the same thing, but... Yeah, but so so AJ or excuse me, Kurt then climbed on the announced desk and he declared, "Tonight is the beginning of the end of TNA." Yay! And I cackled, "Hell of a dance!" Woo-hoo! It was great news. And he said they were going to take out everyone one by one. Okay, <laughs> great. So yeah, so all I could think was, remember, this is not why WCW died directly, but uh, in the dying days of WCW, the angle was Scott Steiner was taking out Goldberg, and then he took out DDP, and then he took out Staying, and then he took out Booker T. Vince Russo only has, like, three ideas. <laughs> no shit. Gang You're wars. You're to the fucking choir here. <laughs> Gang wars, taking guys out one by one, and embarrassing women. Yeah. Yes. That's everything. God, that's a shitty show. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't hate it. And again, this Look was... Look at what the show was done to me. This was better than usual. God. 